We are glad to greet you at the opening of the sixth conference workshop on the political risks and forecasts, the international uncertainty 2021-22. I'm the acting director of the School of International Relations, and I'm glad that our today's conference is held here offline, despite all the restrictions related to the international situation, not from the point of view of stability and security, but also new challenges entailed connected with COVID. I'm grateful to representatives of the 16 countries who are participating online and offline, and will share their impressions of the prospects of the international situation in the coming year. Like never before, the world is in the process of transformation. Several years ago, our courses on the history of international relations included statements like history in the past was more active. Now we are watching history being shaped in front of our eyes. Trying to find the correct idiom to describe the current um, period some several years ago when we started our annual conferences on forecasting we suggested the following idiom that the world is in a state of international uncertainty since that time uh, we uh, came uh, to understand how how correct it is we never know what to expect next year we are grateful to uh, our rector Anatoly Vasilyevich Turkunov because uh, several uh, years on end, uh, he comes uh, to open up our conference uh, with his message of greetings and his opening statement. Mrs. Karen Neisel, um, uh, who, uh, and we have the honor of welcoming her at our session, and we hope to hear her uh, impressions. She's going to, to share with us impressions about how it is um, probably more logical and more relevant for us to train future diplomats. And uh, she uh, recently published a book um, and uh, uh, her ideas will be very useful here. Alexei uh, Drabinin, acting director of the director of uh, foreign policy planning of uh, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We also hope to listen to a presentation uh, uh, to understand better the uh, mentality way of thinking in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we are grateful for cooperation which we have with this department. And the director of the of this department traditionally shares at our conferences shares his intellectual and exciting long-term vision of how the international situation is going to develop. Now we'd like to ask uh, Anatoly Vasilievich to address the participants of the conference. Thank you. Dear friends, dear Carol, first of all, I would like to greet you all very cordially and uh, thank you. Thank, uh, thank our foreign guests uh, who, despite uh, uh, cold Moscow weather, decided uh, to come and participate in uh, the conference. I understand that the weather and uh, the clouded skies uh, somehow press it to the ground, not only international relations, but the weather again as well. Uh, we have been discussing this subject for several years, but I think this year it's uh, particularly relevant because in the past months we have witnessed I would say fast, very fast developing tension. Now people uh, say that this is mainly media created uh, tension. It's uh, difficult to provide uh, an objective assessment from the position of the current situation, because even if it is uh, created by the media, but uh, it is accompanied uh, by the uh, movement of military forces, especially pr practically in the center of Europe. And uh, this creates uh, the uh, food for very serious uh, considerations for us. And this is happening at the moment uh, when uh, in the international relations as a whole and uh, in the public consciousness, uh, we see rather depressing mood uh, related to the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic which uh, we cannot uh, uh, conquer uh, in any of the countries, even uh, in those countries where statistics prove uh, that uh, most of the population uh, have been vaccinated. But still, uh, we witness a way after way of uh, the pandemic. Either the old uh, strands or the new ones emerge 
and uh, this does not help uh, with the certainty, introduces more uncertainty, not only in the international relations, but in the consciousness of people, uh, the uh, social, uh, social consci consciousness. And the uh, national borders um, and uh, the international situation in general, uh, this is experienced in all these fields. And we see in various uh, media reports and uh, thanks to cable uh, TV, we have uh, now an opportunity to watch uh, reports, uh, not only 60 minutes uh, a day, but also watch CNN, not only Solovyov, but other programs, CNN and other programs. So there is uh, some kind of uh, sub suppre suppression in our mood. And we feel uh, this kind of uh, doomed uh, doom attitude in those channels, uh, some kind of uncertainty, uh, pessimism. So it's difficult uh, in this situation under the circumstances to predict uh, how the situation is going to develop. But specialists in international relations are expected uh, to come up uh, with a forecast, especially as uh, they receive new tools, new instruments, uh, processing uh, huge data, and uh, at our university, uh, within uh, the program 2030, we have uh, such a university uh, program, we won in a, in a contest to this effect, uh, and uh, it, um, it entails uh, a digitalization of the process using big data and new platforms, new tools to analyze international relations, not only international relations, but uh, uh, the economic, social developments, and I think that uh, this will uh, provide the positive results. So we should not be extremely op optimistic and hope that all the problems will be solved. But still, uh, the comments which we already receive, uh, even at our university, uh, the Institute of International Relations, I think these results of the research are very interesting. And uh, I hope that uh, these tools uh, will be used actively in uh, the teaching process and the research process. Andrei Sushentsov now is the dean of the largest school, of the oldest school, uh, adult, so to say, school of our university, the school which was the origin of the University of International Relations, was established in 1943 with the Moscow State University, and then it became, it was transformed into uh, an independent institute coming under the auspices of the Institute of, of, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Well, I think I have focused on the pivotal issues which you are going to discuss and to analyze. And the, the comments which I wanted to also uh, uh, make uh, uh, is the importance of talking about the new uh, bipolarity, the United States and China. This is uh, the subject uh, which is in the center of attention and uh, looking through uh, research journals related to the foreign policy analysis, uh, Russian and the foreign publications. I see that uh, about one third of the publications are devoted to the subject. If not uh, bilateral relations, they are devoted to China and everything relating to China. This is an independent subject, of course, a large subject, important one. And also important in the analysis of the possible developments in, the, in 2022. And uh, this subject, uh, which will occupy a place of importance in the deliberations. I do not uh, see any Chinese participants. Yes, we'll have them, uh, but uh, online. So we shall listen to their opinions as well. I believe uh, that such discussions, uh, like the one uh, which we're having today, getting get together as some people would describe them. So they are of, uh, of great importance because we receive uh, a unique opportunity to listen to different points of view, which rely on different sources, many sources. Sometimes the sources are the same, but sometimes they uh, vary. And the expert community at the national level, at the uh, level of the expert community, discusses uh, these subjects. 
and uh, when there is an international venue, it's uh, even better. Uh, then the picture is uh, more clear, um, more clear cut. And I hope that our traditional meetings held at the Mgimo University on the issues of forecasting international relations. Maybe forecast is a, a, a tall order, but our vision, let's say our vision, how things are going to develop. And uh, this is of great importance. That's why I wholeheartedly support what our Institute of International Research is doing in this field and also support their plans. And I want to wish to you all an interesting discussion. And as a result, yes, very interesting reports. Thank you. Спасибо большое, уважаемый Анатолий Васильевич, уважаемый Андрей Андреевич, уважаемая госпожа Кнайсель. Для меня большая честь сегодня выступить здесь с очень коротким обращением. Хотел бы сразу сказать, что ну, прогнозирую. Планирование невозможно без прогнозирования, поэтому без анализа и прогнозирования. Поэтому, безусловно, вот это направление прогнозирования в той мере, в какой это, это возможно, необходимо развивать и совершенствовать. Тем более, что мир сейчас, сейчас скажу очень банальную вещь, но она без этого, она не... Она не она остается верной. Мир вступил в период глубоких трансформаций, затрагивающих практически все сферы жизни. И мы должны понимать, к чему эти трансформации ведут. Этот вопрос интересен не только экспертам, но и нам, практикам, непосредственно занятым в сфере внешней политики. Мы надеемся и желаем участникам сегодняшних дискуссий внести вклад в поиске ответа на этот вопрос. Сейчас я хочу очень коротко затронуть четыре темы, четыре вопроса, которые, на наш взгляд, усиливают неопределенность в международных делах, как минимум в среднесрочной перспективе. Первый момент. Мир становится по-настоящему многополярным. Здесь я сделаю небольшое отступление от подготовленного текста и отреагирую на дискуссии по поводу новой биполярности. Это, в принципе, удобная модель. Она, наверное, уже сформирована в головах экспертов холодной войной. На наш взгляд, эта модель сегодня не отвечает реалиям, потому что говорить о биполярности довольно сложно с учетом той роли, которую играет Россия, в частности, на международной арене. Такие игроки, как Индия... Perhaps uh, this paradigm is not quite up to date. Uh, as an analytical model, uh, of course, it has some reasons to exist, but and as uh, uh, some basis for discussions. But the world, in reality, is more complex than that. And now we see the institutionalization of the new multipolarity. And quite an important factor that is going to shape this uncertainty in, in the future is the internal processes in the economy, for example, of the United States. So we see that U.S. elites are not quite persistent, uh, are not quite uh, consistent in their action. Uh, so, for example, the country has left the Paris uh, Climate Agreement, uh, which was based on the idea of returning uh, production uh, 
in, in uh, the national borders. And now we see that there is quite big attention paid to the agenda of uh, climate change, of new alliances, of digitalization, and, and the so-called crusade of the new ideology. which is uh, more or less formed by, this agenda is more or less formed by the Democratic Party of the United States. And uh, uh, we, if the next election will bring the Republicans into power, so there will be hope that uh, there will be changes in the domestic and international policy of the country. So this is a factor that contributes to the uncertainty in the world and makes uh, forecasting quite difficult. So the second point that contributes to uncertainty is the blurring border between war and peace in the international arena, so which increase, increases the uh, risk of uh, military confrontation between world powers. So we can speak about uh, uncertainty in the um, minds of political elites. So, for example, yesterday, Senator Weaker said that, if I'm not mistaken, and citing uh, his words quite uh, um, clearly and accurately, so uh, he said that uh, Russia... Uh, could use nuclear arms um, in the future. So such things cannot be made in such an easy way. And uh, we have to take it into account. And we see that the paradigm which is being imposed by our US counterparts, namely the paradigm of the confrontation between big powers, this paradigm is imposed both on Russia and China, although the countries are quite unwilling to pursue this path. So this usage of uh, their monopoly in different international areas, uh, using different instruments of exacerbating local uh, conflicts, for example, uh, using it as an instrument in competition. So all this leads to less strategic stability in the world. So you all know that, and this is quite a commonplace thing, nothing original, but we cannot ignore such things. Besides, now we see that the status quo that was achieved uh, after the uh, World War, uh, after the Second World War, uh, is also changing. For example, uh, Jake Sullivan uh, has made a statement that has been responded to by the Foreign Office of Russia. So, according to him, that the system, which was based on the outcomes of the Second World War has become outdated. And so the US is trying to create the new system of flexible alliances. And here we can say only that uh, we can thank uh, Mr. Sullivan for such, uh, direct, uh, such a direct statement. Uh, this is something that we have been speaking about for a long time already. We see it as an instrument of undermining the system of international relations uh, that has saved uh, the world from different conflicts for half a century uh, that also undermines the authority of the UN. And I would like to remind that the UN was created not to create a paradise on the world, but to 
escape from uh, hell on the, in the world. So, and we should remember that. So, point number three I would like to speak about, which is also important when we speak about planning and forecasting, is that we have entered a new historical period of technological breakthroughs in different areas, and we see a transition to uh, a new system of economy in the world, which is defined by new energy, technology, medicine, uh, achievements and advancements, so which transforms the market and the labor market and changes the uh, social structure of communities and societies. And it may open a new opportunity on the one hand, but on the other hand, it uh, gives a, an opportunity to new risks in terms of, for example, exploring space or finding new technologies and so on. And of course, it also makes its impact on international relations. And finally, point number four is the growing uh, disparity and inequality in the world. Everybody is speaking about the necessity to fight inequality, poverty, and about assisting developing countries of Asia and Africa in achieving a higher level of development. Lots of events and conferences are devoted to these issues, but we cannot see any positive breakthroughs in solving those issues. So we see great achievements in China, for example, uh, domestically, uh, and a number of uh, countries in the southeast of Asia, but in general, inequality is growing. Uh, we can see the growing inequality rates even in the so-called developed countries, which is also a factor of uncertainty in the world and gives an impetus to uncontrolled migration, waves, uh, growing terrorist activity and new conflicts in different regions of the world. All this makes it uncontrollable to uh, fight this uncertainty in the world. At the same time, I would like to say that we have to be very woke when we speak about such nuances in the development of the international situation. We also should keep in mind that there is a big picture of global development and uh, in general I can say that the world has all opportunities to solve all these issues but Political will is needed to do that. So we have to understand the contemporary situation in the world. Uh, and we cannot say that we are very good at that. And we have to unite our efforts in tackling those new challenges. And to sum up, I would like to thank Mgimo and the Institute of International Research uh, for our cooperation. And I would like to wish uh, all success to uh, Andrei Andreevich in his new capacity. And I would like to wish all those present today and tomorrow uh, success in your work in this conference, on our part, we are always ready to make discussions, to exchange our opinions. 
so I would wish you all success uh, today and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Alexei Yurievich. So now we have to uh, close the ceremony of opening our conference and we are going over to the so-called special session which is called uh, the Universal Diplomat for the 21st century. So the uh, focus of the session is the following one. On a regular basis, we put a question and the question is, what is a good diplomat for future international relations? So how can we train these diplomats so uh, should we focus more on the so-called digital skills, uh, which are quite typical now of the training in Europe and the United States, for example, um, where diplomats are trained on this uh, basis of project work, teamwork, and so on, and uh, less attention is paid to languages, for example, to learning uh, cultures of different countries, and so the core of diplomats is changing uh, because the old diplomats were more focused on languages and understanding of local elites. Uh, all this leads to a universal uh, platform uh, of project work. So in our Russian tradition, we have always used the uh, classical system of training diplomats, uh, which is based on languages, first of all. So usually our graduates speak two languages. Uh, one of them should be some uh, oriental language, which is quite difficult to learn. Uh, and uh, so our students uh, are more sportsmen, so to speak, in learning languages because it is really difficult to learn more than one language at once. And at the same time, we cannot ignore that the tradition, the contemporary tradition of training diplomats um, is changing. Uh, and we would like to understand how practical this change is. So, for example, this attitude and approach of leadership from behind, for example. So the new American experts with alliances uh, in the Asian Pacific region, for example, the alliance with Australia, which was an ad hoc alliance uh, aiming at selling submarines to Australia. So, and we're trying to understand how relevant this approach is. And I would like to thank our counterparts and our colleagues today uh, for their participating in our today's discussion. And uh, we would like to learn their um, point of view on that. For example, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Karen Kneisel. Uh, uh, so I would like to uh, uh, greet here uh, Ms. Karen Kneisel, Fyodor Lukyanov, and, uh, Samuel Cherub, and Konstantin Kolpakov. And I would like to give the floor uh, uh, to, to ask Konstantin to sit a little bit closer. And now I, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Karen Kneisel uh, and uh, ask her to uh, uh, share her opinion. Thank you very much, Mr. Professor Tokunov, for also conveying me already last year to come as a visiting professor to GIMO, which is a sincere honor and pleasure. I had uh, the opportunity to speak uh, to your colleagues uh, back in 2018 and 2019, and we are currently conducting two seminars, one actually on the craft and mastery of diplomacy, uh, and I've been carefully listening uh, to the words of uh, Dean Shushentsov, um, mentioning classical education. And yes, the key message of my intervention will be uh, classical education, education in languages still has its merits and its place. 
I'm not so much a fan of uh, the skills, <laughs> of the competences. Uh, let me use one keyword, which I also discussed uh, with uh, the students of the course. It has a lot to do with talent. And um, you need, of course, the cultivation of a talent, but talent comes first and foremost. And in that context, I would like to start with a quote by a, a British diplomat and author, Harold Nicholson, who wrote a classic back in 1939. It has been reproduced ever since, again and again. Um, and uh, as some of you might know, Nicholson quitted the British Foreign Service in 1919 for the simple reason that he was disgusted by what he saw in the uh, treatise of uh, 1919. He was one of those like uh, Keynes who, who didn't trust this, this, this treatise. He was very right. And he said, what we have been doing in the suburb of Paris in 1919 has little to do with diplomacy. So I prefer to do my gardening and he ever on went to do his gardening and garden landscaping and writing books, luckily for, for all of us. So his legacy is there. Um, there's one key quote, and I would say each of that attributes he uses, these attributes he uses is still valid, but I would like to add some more. So let me start the quote. The qualities of my ideal diplomat, truth, accuracy, calm, patience, good temper, modesty, and loyalty. These are also the qualities of an ideal diplomacy. But the reader may object. You have forgotten intelligence, knowledge, discernment, prudence, hospitality, charm, industry, courage, and even tact. I have not forgotten them. I have taken them for granted. End of the quote. <laughs> so each and every of those attributes uh, are still very valid. Uh, let me add to that maybe a fine sense of humor, sometimes black humor, such in these days, <laughs> but humor. <laughs> and uh, uh, humor always helps to not take oneself too serious. <laughs> um, uh, and it also takes what I may add. Um, and discussing that also with, with younger colleagues again and again, uh, you need a certain potential to absorb frustration. You need to absorb the frustration that your work is not honored in the sense that you would like to see it honored. Be it the report that you write, the assessment of the situation that never arrives in the cabinet of the minister. You are part of the of the lower level of the decision shapers. I always focus on this word in English, which to my knowledge doesn't exist in other languages. I, I know decision shaper. It's a wonderful word. Does it exist in Russian? Decision shaper? I, it's, yeah, but, but I, it's, it's, as a diplomat, you are part of this decision shapers. And the decision taker bases his or her uh, final decision then on those elements. But do the elements that you write as the second, third, fourth secretary in the embassy of wherever you are posted, do they ever arrive up in the cabinet? Do they ever enter the speaking notes the minister will use in, in the talks? Uh, and uh, this is one potential frustration. Of course, the other one, and many of you who have been uh, not only in diplomatic uh, organization, but it also holds true for organizing a, a meeting like ours today. Uh, you work and work, and then for whatever reason, the visit, the conference is canceled. Uh, the pandemic has turned the whole world in one big inshallah, as I always say. It's, we are all becoming very <laughs> orientalized. I Luckily, I spent some time in the Middle East, in Lebanon, and uh, so I took my homeopathic dosage of fatalism, uh, but it can go beyond what you can take sometimes. So uh, to absorb this frustration and thereby what is very important and I would like to focus on as a message to those who, who join us via Zoom, please, whatever uh, might happen in your professional life, don't turn cynical. There are too many cynics around especially in diplomacy. Uh, I myself have uh, recently seen a lot of setbacks, 
And every morning I woke up, my first wish was, I don't want to turn bitter. I don't want to become a cynical, despite all what has happened. Because uh, if possible, this professional activity needs a good sense of curiosity, some sort of idealism in the sense that uh, one is uh, committed, that one is ready, and it takes not only intellectual strength, it takes also, I would say, quite physical strength uh, to move on, to reconcile your professional life with some sort of family life. Uh, it's very difficult for young male uh, servicemen in the, in the foreign service and also holds true for the military service and other expat uh, professions to find a spouse who's ready to join you to do that. But it's, I would say, 90% impossible for a, a lady diplomat to do that. And uh, there has been a lot of, 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 of conference talking and saying, no, no, this is right. I can tell you it's not that easy to reconcile. It's often impossible to reconcile. So uh, it can also mean a lot of um, solitude, loneliness, boredom. Uh, and all that has to be taken into account when opting for this professional uh, way of uh, fulfilling your life in the service of your country. And I always insist it's the diplomatic service, the foreign service. It's not so much a diplomatic career. The word career comes from the Latin notion of correre, which is about running, running until complete exhaustion. Uh, or you can also take it from the French notion, which sometimes I think is even more telling, carrière. And carrière is the place where the stones are cut. Uh, so it's not a very nice place to work in. And you might end up like Sisyphus, uh, pushing up uh, the stone every day and finding pleasure in, in, in repeating that, uh, that labor. So uh, don't turn cynical. Don't turn pitter. Try to find your inner so bubble of oxygen that is necessary and uh, keep a good sense of curiosity and discreetness at the same time. Being discreet is an element that has been lost over the years. It has been lost due to the technologies that were already mentioned today, but it has also been lost, I would say, to, due to a loss of good manners. Uh, we are in a world of uh, permanent transparency, permanent publicity, uh, and um, we can discuss at length, does it make sense that each and every member of, of a diplomatic post has his or her own uh, tweet account, Instagram account, um, <laughs> which can sometimes uh, be a pain in the neck uh, for, for the foreign policy of, of, of the whole country. I've seen that with a uh, recent case I remember, it's not that recent, two, three years ago, British uh, ambassador to Lebanon was ousted uh, because of a, of a tweet uh, she made on behalf of the death of a Shiite clergy. Uh, so uh, things can, 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 can happen and, and, and create problematic situations. Um, but this discreetness, I, I, I would like to focus on because you really have to find for yourself throughout uh, your practice, and it's only gained via practice, um, where to take this tightrope walk. Uh, good sense of curiosity, knowing how to create an atmosphere in which certain things can become possible. As a, as a diplomat, you're not supposed to be now the expert on all and each and every macroeconomic detail of the country where you're posted, but it's about knowing how to make the setup and how to keep the channels working. Uh, there might be a long period of inactivity, but there is the moment of a hostage crisis, of a major breakout where you know, have to know whom you can call at four o'clock in the morning in order to, to get, for instance, your citizens out of the country because of a certain situation. And um, this requires um, a good deal of, 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 of work in beforehand. 
Uh, when I speak of, of discreteness, um, finally, it was uh, at a late stage in my life, I've been reading the souvenirs of André François Poncet. He was the uh, French ambassador to Berlin in the 1930s. And I was honestly, I was not aware that his reports already in the 1930s of what's going on in Nazi Germany were leaked to the public. It's, it's not something that started in our time. I'm thinking there of uh, the political reports by the British ambassador to Washington, which were leaked recently and which led uh, to the expelling, uh, to calling back of the ambassador. Uh, it's something that has always been there. And uh, it, in, in the case of André François Poncé, uh, it, it, it was a life danger to him. I mean, he really had to go underground in, in Vichy, France. Uh, so uh, it's risky. Uh, how much can you trust that that what you do or your work, your written texts are kept discreet? Is there still something like confidential confidentiality? I doubt it. I, I, I deplore the fact that I must say I don't see any confidentiality in our days, in our today's um, interstate work. I don't see it. And this is a major problem. Because without confidentiality, very difficult to build up trust. And without trust, no reliability, no, no belief in, uh, in solid uh, relations on which you can rely on the world that you can rely. You can call it the word, uh, the word of honor. Uh, I, I, I might sound very old fashioned, but I think that these uh, aspects still have the role to play. Uh, so digital skills, one thing, but uh, all those aspects uh, which I quoted, whether by uh, Harold Nicholson, uh, whether that what I added are still valid. Um, there are not many institutions that teach the real topic of diplomacy. GIMO, to my knowledge, is one of the very, very few. The Diplomatic Academy in Vienna, which uh, has the fame of being the oldest still existing, yes, it was established under Maria Theresia in the mid 18th century. We had 250 50 dispersed in 2004. It was highly celebrated, but uh, I've been teaching there for, for 20 years. Uh, I uh, had to stop for various reasons, uh, which were all political. Um, but um, I, uh, I did not see true uh, topics of diplomacy. It's all about uh, macroeconomics, uh, Excel skills. Uh, it's about uh, national security aspects maybe, but not what diplomacy is about. And this has led not only in the case of the Austrian uh, diplomatic service, but I've observed it in particular inside the external action service of the European Commission. Uh, uh, let me put it like that. We do have a majority of people with a background in political sciences, but not in diplomacy. Uh, and... Uh, uh, a representative office of the external action service, which is supposed to be the diplomatic branch of the European Commission, for the time being is more a kind of para structure, which I would say, and that's the way I describe it also in my book, uh, it's more a kind of administrative body in terms of distributing uh, financial resources in the country where they are posted. But it's not about uh, the genuine work of diplomacy, which means consular services, there's none, uh, which means um, opening, keeping channels at work. And uh, let me bring in here one thought, which I repeatedly uh, uh, say, this book of 400 pages, I could have also done it on one page by saying diplomacy equals in a mathematic formula, keep communication channels open under all, but under all circumstances. That's what diplomacy is about. The rest is illustration. <laughs> 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 but you can really break it down to this mathematic formula. And this mathematic formula is not heated. Uh, best example, and international relations is still suffering from that, is uh, 
1979, uh, the U.S. in the turmoil of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, let me briefly recapitulate the year 1979. Not that I was there, but I followed it as, as an interested teenager from far away and later on read about it. Uh, 1st of January 1979, um, Jimmy Carter, U.S. President of the United States, celebrates the New Year's uh, beginning together with uh, Shah Reza Bahlavi, saying in his speech, Iran is an island of tranquility in a turmoil, in an ocean of turmoil. Uh, apparently, his office had not provided him with the reports by Ambassador O'Sullivan, who had been warning against developments. I mean, there have been general strikes, uh, things were going on ever since 1978 at the latest, and maybe in the provinces even before. Um, three weeks later, no, sorry, six weeks later, it was on the 14th of February, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini boards an Air France flight, and uh, you maybe remember this famous picture of uh, Khomeini walking down the, uh, the staircase with the French uh, captain of, of Air France, arriving in, um, in Tehran and turning a national Iranian revolution into an Islamic revolution, very much to the surprise of the rest of the world. Um, and diplomatic relations were still going on. They stopped with the hostage taking in November 1979. Otherwise, they might have continued, but ever since, no diplomatic relations. Um, to put it in a nutshell, what we have been listening from the United States on that topic, and it was not only on that topic, was the following. People we don't like, we don't talk to. Now, this is what I call... Uh, Apologies, but I've said it was in public beforehand. I don't mind. I call it the teenager approach. Um, <laughs> a teenager, when he or she is unhappy with the rest of the world, goes up to the room, closes the door and says, the world is bad. I don't want to see that world. And I only come out of my room uh, when I decide, when the world is maybe getting a better place. Uh, so we are today... Uh, 40 years later, my observation has been we're in a world full of teenagers, regardless of their age. It's the right of the 12 to 16 year old to say I'm fed up with this world and I don't like this world and I fight against this world. It's their right. That has always been like that. Whether it was Friedrich Schiller who turned his anger into literature uh, or whether it was... Um, or whether it's others who, 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 who protest against armament, against killing the trees, the whales, whatever. I also did it. Uh, but I have one more minute. Yeah. But there arrives a moment when you should be mature and uh, talk to people despite the fact that you have emotional problems. And uh, this is what I think is also very important to take along. There is a um, there is this need for much more maturity, for much more soberness, and not get lost in, in emotions. So uh, all that national interests, keeping in mind the overall framework, serving your country, not going to national in certain cases, etc. We all know that. Uh, but at the same time, it's also very useful to keep up the good chemistry among people. And uh, Yevgeny Brimakov, whom I have been admiring ever since I, I observed his work in Baghdad in 1991, uh, was the one who knew how to reconcile all that. And I think it's always worse, also still today, a few years after his death, to remember how to walk this tightrope walk between all these objective interests, these objective facts, and how to create personal contacts, which can be very important. Sometimes it's three o'clock in the morning for the sake of your citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, great uh, statement. I think it provides us so with some optimism about training uh, diplomats at Zemgimo because classical diplomacy uh, does work. And uh, with this introduction, I would like to ask Fedor Lukyanov to share his impressions, our, uh, well, uh, our distinguished uh, analyst, uh, a person uh, whom uh, you 
uh, you you see quite often uh, online uh, and uh, you, you usually provide the uh, very uh, very outstanding uh, and uh, very individual uh, analysis so uh, what can we do on the one hand uh, we lack confidentiality diplomatic conventions are violated and a leak of information is a norm of uh, communication. Is diplomacy really in a crisis situation? Shall we introduce a special course on how to fight uh, fight uh, leaks in uh, the work of uh, uh, diplomatic services? Or should we continue working uh, in the classical way? Thank you very much. Uh, so, um, Andrei Andreevich has named me, uh, has marked me as the uh, flagship uh, of uh, uh, analysis, then I will play the role and uh, I will speak a little bit at odds at what you have discussed here, because I'm an, an outsider. Uh, I don't have uh, an international relations background and I've never studied in GIMO. And so my flagship uh, role will be the following one. So speaking about the question uh, about whether uh, we have to introduce um, a course, a special course de dedicated to how to make leaks, uh, no. Uh, so leaks are usually uh, something that uh, exist on their own. And uh, as Ms. Kneisel has mentioned, uh, it is something that has always existed. So I would start with the following thing. Speaking about the uh, topic of our discussion, the universal diplomat of the 21st century, then in my perspective, uh, this topic is um, not relevant for uh, the situation uh, we find ourselves in, because there is nothing universal in the 21st century. So everything universal uh, is left behind in uh, the 20th century and uh, the beginning of the uh, 21st century um, has introduced a new idea that there is nothing universal and in the times of the Cold War, for example, the idea of universality uh, was more than one, uh, at least two. One of them uh, was forgotten after the Cold War, but the uh, second one prevailed. And uh, there were some need in universal things at that time. But now we're entering a new stage when pluralism and accessibility of uh, uh, the environment in relations in the world are increasing. And in this respect, universal diplomacy is not possible. Speaking about uh, your question that you asked me at the beginning, um, namely this, uh, what are the new traits of diplomats in today's world? What kind of training we should give them in this new aggressive information environment? Uh, I would say, yes, this is quite an important factor and it has its impact on everything, not only diplomacy. And here we can see two questions. If we have, the first one is, uh, do we have to respond to this, this situation? And uh, if we have to respond to the situation, then what kind of benchmark we should use to rate our success? So I would say that Russian diplomacy uh, cannot be reprimanded for not being able to work in this aggressive new environment. I would say that uh, today's Russian diplomacy is even more aggressive than even the best practices in the world. And uh, so Russian diplomacy is playing the role of uh, this flagship uh, that you spoke about. So, but the question is, do we profit by it? So the press uh, service of our foreign office, uh, although sounds it sounds quite aggressive, does not influence our foreign counterparts in any way, although it is quite welcome welcomed in uh, within the country. So and now we can discuss 
uh, quite an important feature of today's situation, uh, and namely the blurring line between internal and external. So we used to think that diplomacy is quite a thing of its own, uh, some kind of ivory castle, so to speak, ivory tower, um, and diplomats are quite um, a refined and closed community. But now we see a different approach. So first of all, uh, there is some kind of crisis in expert opinions. Uh, and besides, uh, lots of information now uh, is given from the out inside to the outside. And this vision of the ivory tower has been destroyed for that reason. And we should discuss in this respect, what is the added value of diplomatic efforts and all public agencies. So what is the, uh, so to speak, the uh, added value of this effort to be up to these new approaches in the world? So I'm not sure that we have to respond to these new trends uh, in the international situation because, of course, we can learn something new. We uh, can learn, for example, how to work in uh, the world of social networks uh, and digital technologies and so on. But so what is the positive result of that? So, as I said, I'm an outsider. Perhaps uh, Konstantin will explain it in a better way than me, but nevertheless, I see a paradox. So on the one hand, we do not see classical diplomacy anymore uh, because of this transparency and uh, a number of other uh, factors. So the blurring line, uh, the blurred line between external and internal, as I, as I have said, but at the same time, we see that there is some kind of value uh, in uh, uh, learning the classical foundations of diplomacy and it is even increasing and I would say that uh, to my students in the high school of economics, uh, I always uh, tell them that you have to learn the basics, uh, the basic theory behind international relations. But in the situation of uncertainty, when there is complete chaos in the information environment, you sometimes cannot tell right from wrong and something authentic from something fake. The only thing that can be a remedy to this is uh, um, basics. So the classical theory behind all the processes. So of course, we can speak about different new forms of diplomacy, which we see arising in the world, but uh, still, if we look deeper, we'll, we'll see that nothing has changed in the world since ancient Greece. And in this respect, so this basic theory uh, can be a help, can be an instrument in responding to new challenges. And so the main function of MGIMO, for example, and all institutions, uh, academies, and so on that uh, train diplomats, so they train them in this classical way as well, because there is a growing value in that, in this new world. Because what you can give them, you can give them theory, and then they will apply this theory in practice. When we speak about global trends that can be used in the system of training for diplomats, is the understanding that we see the end of the era of institutions. For example, Russian diplomacy is famous for its conservatism in terms of its uh, communication with international institutes and institutions. Uh, but now we see that it's not working anymore. And when we apply, for example, to an international institution, then this institution takes a decision uh, that runs counter to uh, 
Russian policy, then we say that this institution is not right and should be changed. But this is not how it should be done, because we should remember that these international institutions are the legacy of the second half of the 20th century. And now we see a time which is uh, based on different ad hoc approaches. But this ad hoc approach is also regulated by some trends. So uh, we uh, have heard about this ad hoc alliance between the US and Australia uh, in some um, mocking way. But uh, here I would disagree because uh, it was not about submarines, but uh, it was about very deep uh, 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 culture-based relations between the US and uh, Australia. And for them, this alliance was a very working arrangement, a very efficient arrangement. So this approach of learning theory should be accompanied by, but, uh, by uh, a deeper insight into cultures, not only political cultures, but cultural cultures, so to speak, because it's going to play quite a role in diplomacy as well. Uh, to uh, say it simpler, so the more, uh, the less, uh, the few institutions we have, the more instincts we have. And these instincts are based on culture. One more thing is that diplomacy is quite bureaucratic. So this red tape is something which is quite, impossible to overcome sometimes. And so any bureaucracy uh, protects itself. Uh, any bureaucracy insists that it should be perfected, but it has nothing to do with real things in life. This is something that impresses me all the time in our relations with the US uh, when it comes to this uh, battle uh, in terms of uh, missions and uh, embassies. I, feel quite uh, uh, a big sympathy uh, uh, with diplomats because I don't understand this embassy war between the countries because it prevents us from regular procedures such as getting a visa, for example. So in this respect, uh, okay, so we have uh, to open a consular service, for example. Uh, so, because this system of embassies uh, implies that relations should develop in a very intensive way. But now we cannot see that. And so, I don't see any point in this embassy uh, war, because it doesn't produce any good effect. So, what I mean is that diplomatic services should be transformed in a very flexible way. So, and diplomats should feel that. And the last thing to mention here is something that perhaps relates more to us than to uh, anybody else. We see some kind of uh, West centrism in our mindset. This is not the problem of Mgimo, for example, or diplomats. This is the problem of our society. This West centrism uh, also is also accompanied by lack of understanding of what we want this West to do and how we can behave in international relations so leads to a paradox because sometimes it leads to a conflict and sometimes it leads to a farce that we have seen uh, in the last weeks. So when this world war in Twitter, for example, takes place and it does not influence anything in the in the real world. To sum up, I would say that Andrei Andreevich is now the fl flagship of uh, uh, our department and of our uh, international relations um, educational system. I would say that this combination of very deep knowledge of theory and deep understanding of cultures of different countries 
is the key to success to uh, for everybody. Fyodor Alexandrovich, thank you very much. You have given uh, quite lots of information to us because we have uh, to take it into account and change our curricular. And this is quite a difficult uh, bureaucratic task, as you know. But speaking about your observations about the style of communication uh, is becoming more and more bright in dif on different platforms. I would say the, the uh, current crisis is uh, some kind of historical, as the president has cautiously said, we're undertaking the necessary military and technological measures and invite you to discuss the conditions for cancelling them. This is not a Twitter diplomacy, this is quite a classical diplomatic approach. And uh, to, uh, Samuel Cherub is uh, present here, and uh, this is a person that has quite an experience in observing um, Russian diplomacy and politics uh, from the inside, and uh, he is quite an expert uh, in our country. So we see uh, very few people in the United States uh, of that kind of competence and we would like to uh, ask you what ideas you could share with us, how we could tr train our diplomats to uh, not undertake the necessary political and military measures. Thank you, Andre, for invitation and for this opportunity uh, to make a presentation today. So this is quite an easy task for me to speak about this topic because I'm neither a diplomat uh, nor uh, a teacher, a professor, so and so I don't have any uh, authority here in this respect and any responsibility, but Fyodor Alexandrovich, uh, who I respect very much, has said a lot about um, the fact that uh, diplomacy is a thing of the past already, but I think that diplomacy is going to be a thing of the future. Perhaps now it is a thing of the past, uh, but this is quite a logical development in the current situation, but at the same time, a logical development is uh, going to be the return of diplomacy in the short perspective, short-term perspective, uh, which is uh, going to be some kind of cooperation between not only rivals, but uh, uh, between friends as well. And this is an inevitable development in the conditions that we will find ourselves uh, in the coming historical period. So on the one hand, this is a big war between the great powers. Um, uh, on the one hand, we, we cannot imagine that there can be a big war between big powers, taking into account the nuclear containment, but at the same time, rivalry and competition is increasing rapidly, which means that diplomacy uh, will be will find itself in a more difficult situation, but at the same time, it will be in more demand. Because if we cannot solve the problem by war, then there is no other response to this but diplomacy. I would say that in the previous period, especially before 2014, if we speak about the uh, relations between Russia and the West, so in the period of relative, of relatively favorable period, when we talked about common security, common space, even in the Euro-Atlantic relations. Lots of agreements were concluded at that time. And in that period, in comparison uh, with today, uh, it was quite an easy period for diplomats, meaning that the insecurity in international relations was less. 
And it was easier to come to agreement and uh, to come to a compromise and take some decisions. And in some time, it is, to a certain degree, easy to be a diplomat even now, because there is nothing to do now in terms of complicated agreements or negotiations and compromises. So you can make some kind of uh, movements or maneuvers uh, or you can present your talking points to the others. And uh, there is no special need for any complicated uh, processes and need to find compromise decisions. It is difficult to be a diplomat uh, at uh, the time of more structured uh, competition, more structured rivalry. But uh, I think uh, before uh, the time, uh, before the uh, uh, before our life improves, uh, things will get worse. And will get worse, and uh, uh, this is the time when diplomats uh, acquire p particular value, importance, despite the fact that uh, their profession will be even more complicated than at some more beneficial time, or even at the time when the things are only black or white, no shades. So the need and the time for diplomats and for diplomacy will come back, I think. And I agree that this is that studying theory is important. But what is the what is the context? I think that for future diplomats, the main challenge is to find the new principles, the new principles of the new period, period of rivalry. Studying history, history of cold of the Cold War, will be of special importance. Though the period of the Cold War is different in many respects from where we live now. But uh, the period of the Cold War is very rich in uh, the uh, information about uh, uh, compromises uh, between uh, opponents, uh, between uh, adversaries, when uh, they could do that at very difficult times. And uh, they structured uh, their rivalry in order to avoid a direct conflict. And I think studying this kind of history will be very important for future diplomats. And I also want to agree with what Fedor said about public diplomacy. Why so? Maybe not so much public diplomacy, but the publicity, publicity of uh, public behavior of uh, diplomats. Um, because of the reasons uh, which he suggested, uh, which Fedor suggested, that also because uh, this provides an incentive uh, for diplomats to become real hawks. Because if you are a public, uh, if you make public statements in this atmosphere, you need extreme views. You must project yourself uh, as. Uh, um, as an extremist, because nobody will need non-hawks. Because if you are not a hawk, the society will not be interested in you, and you will not have such subscribers in your uh, Instagram or and in some other social network. And when diplomats pretend that they are hawks, they are involved in uh, renouncing themselves. Because if the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is not a ministry for negotiations, or is not ready for, for this kind of activity, then the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, rules itself out uh, of the process of communication. And makes its uh, and, and makes this ministry less important in negotiations. This is what we have been observing recently. Where 
o observo zeta o diplomatsa do not promote do not project as their diplomacy and their objectives as then people do not come to them no, when there is a need for negotiations because uh, such diplomats uh, kind of played down their importance i'm not criticizing anyone i'm just observing the general tendency and uh, another comment on the work of the embassies our relations are so uh, bad and uh, uh, in, uh, I think that in such a period, the presence of diplomats is even of greater importance. The large embassies of the United States in such countries as Great Britain, for example, is not so important. But uh, uh, it is important. Uh, many diplomats are important uh, for a country uh, where relations are complicated. And uh, when uh, there is uh, more uh, need for bet better understanding of the country. Well, with this, I think I will conclude uh, my statement. Thank you. I was especially supported uh, by your statement that we should study the history of the Cold War and uh, probably we should describe it uh, as uh, structuring the confrontation, applied aspects of structuring the confrontation, and introduce a special subject on special military and technical uh, tools, and uh, yes, and uh, repealing them. Konstantin Kolpakov, a great uh, friend of Gimo, our distinguished graduate, I always speak about him as a distinguished uh, product of our university. I hope that we'll have more of them, but Konstantin cannot be repeated. So recently he uh, pre he presented his uh, dissertation. We, con we congratulated him recently. He is in the very thick of uh, the uh, processes uh, that the ministry is carrying out and uh, his view of uh, the problems which you raised is of special interest. So we'll be very interested in your point of view. Uh, Andrei Andreevich, dear colleagues, I'm glad to participate at uh, this very interesting conference, participate in this conference. Uh, as an official of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I cannot comment everything that was mentioned here about the work of our ministry. But uh, nevertheless, it is great for me to have a chance to listen to you all, and I have already a list of comments which I would like to make. And uh, I think that we have, here we have two, here two uh, uh, separate groups, people who represent the diplomatic profession. And uh, uh, Mrs. Neistel, I liked very much what you had to say on the subject. And uh, also uh, uh, representatives of the expert community um, who try maybe uh, to prick diplomats uh, into going in the right direction, sting and prick them. And uh, uh, you have to understand together what instruments we need for further development. So as to the universal diplomat, what is it like? I agree with Fyodor Alexandrovich, Fyodor Lukyanov, that nowadays it's difficult to talk, impossible to talk about a universal diplomat as such. We should talk about uh, traditions, about uh, the uh, uh, fundamental subjects uh, that uh, Ms. Neisel has mentioned, because nowadays uh, a diplomat somehow is associated not so much with the diplomatic profession, but as a kind of showcase, a person who collects, like a question was to me, whether there is a, a, a value added uh, um, uh, uh, elevated uh, uh, element uh, when diplomats participate in social networks or, to, or uh, as a rather young diplomat, uh, I believe uh, that this uh, additional value does exist. And uh, if we look, uh, for example, the need to raise awareness about our position with as many people as possible, then maybe this channel is uh, uh, quite useful. But uh, quite often, this is uh, uh, these tweets and such interesting tweets should be addressed to our partners, to our friends, uh, those people that we communicate with and have contacts with. And also, we should explain our 
policy for people who are interested or those who are not so inter, uh, interested but will be attracted uh, to our headlines or to some facts which we are going to mention in our, uh, in our, on our sites. And uh, uh, so, uh, diplomats and people working in the foreign ministry, uh, they are really decision shapers. These are people who uh, just bring ammunition to those who take decisions, uh, those who are real decision makers. Uh, we have started uh, the 21st century, but so many events uh, have already happened, uh, maybe uh, uh, maybe as many as happened in the 18th century, the whole of the 18th or the whole of the 19th century. And it's difficult to say what's going to happen in uh, two years' time, in three years' time. I don't agree that the epoch of the, the era of the institutions has come to an end. I don't agree with that. I think it would be more correct to say that institutions are not flexible. They do not uh, respond to the changing situation, to the changing environment. And uh, if we do away with institutions and decide that uh, we'll uh, act on the spot, then we'll lose the most important element, which is strategic planning. And strategic planning, I think, can be found nowadays only with uh, a limited number of states. Those states who look uh, at the period of one decade, two decades, uh, though uh, it's now fashionable, uh, has, it ha has become fashionable to write strategies 2030, 2060, but I think that uh, most uh, states limit uh, their horizon to five or ten years only. And the Sam mentioned uh, uh, a question, is it easy to be a diplomat nowadays, uh, right? You sit in, in your office and do nothing. But uh, if you look at the meeting between our president and uh, the US president in Geneva, you see that quite a number of commissions uh, have uh, been set up uh, and they started working uh, and uh, a large group of diplomats uh, are involved in uh, uh, elaborating and uh, working in those commissions. And uh, this is true of the US and Russia, but uh, as to G7 uh, countries there, we can find uh, various spheres of activity, not always visible, but we know that uh, there is work going on. And uh, one of the important qualities of diplomacy is uh, that quite often it is not public, it is not seen. Only about 10% of the diplomatic efforts are visible. But all other things, uh, what is happening at the negotiations and uh, when the trust is being built, and uh, what uh, Ms. Uh, Nysel mentioned, the, the importance of confidence building, uh, we understand that it does not happen overnight. It takes time to build confidence. And when a diplomat serves uh, in another country, and uh, usually he spends about three, five years in another country, he manages to build uh, this confidence or trust uh, with his partners, not at once, but only after he has spent in this country several years. And uh, when people in the country start to recognize him in this capacity, either in the economic or social community, and uh, of course, not only uh, uh, theoretical knowledge is necessary here, but language skills, uh, language competence. And uh, in a country like Austria, if you spend there two years, uh, you start speaking uh, the German language as if you were born there. But uh, we can say that uh, at the Gimo University, the language ground is very good, so no, not a great problem to start speaking like uh, a native. And uh, in our work, uh, we have contacts with uh, many foreign diplomats and we study uh, the training process. Uh, and the conclusion, uh, we made a very interesting conclusion with my uh, fellow workers. In many states, uh, they are not training uh, universal diplomats, but universal bureaucrats. Take India, for example. The competition to the diplomatic service or to the civil service is very high. And it takes people about 10, 15 months to be screened 
for the for the civil service. And uh, this is true of other countries in China too, with with a huge number of applicants. Egypt. I was surprised uh, when I met uh, colleagues, uh, and uh, they described a very similar situation. And the schools of training diplomats, uh, like MGMO or the Vienna Diplomatic Academy, such uh, schools are very few. And uh, we come again uh, to the statement that the basics must be studied. Only if a professional has uh, the fundamentals of uh, the diplomatic service, not just history or trade, but uh, the basics of uh, the diplomatic work, only then uh, we can describe such a person as a professional diplomat uh, who will uh, represent the Ministry of Negotiations, not the Ministry of War, not the Ministry of Trade, but the Ministry of Negotiations, of promoting the interests of the country. And now we are witnessing that uh, the number of such people is not very high. People who really uh, conform to the uh, criteria of a true diplomat. Is it good or bad? That's a difficult question because at the end of the day, a state uh, pursues its uh, uh, objectives, its, uh, its uh, uh, purposes, uh, but what skills are important? This is an open question. What are the qualities for a good diplomat? But I believe uh, the important qualities are, are just confidence uh, that uh, you are doing the right thing, uh, loyalty, uh, healthy, robust patriotism, Face in the policy of your state and constant training, lifelong training, a lifelong excellence. This is a, a very important skill. If you don't have a system structure, the system of retraining and uh, excellence uh, raising, uh, then your knowledge and your skills become obsolete very fast. I think uh, that these are the considerations which are important. And as to the number of diplomats, there was a question, do we need so many diplomats? I think that uh, it's a matter of analysis for individual countries, cutting down the number of diplomats. So this can be done uh, very fast and uh, can be done uh, in any situation, but restoring uh, the diplomatic core may take up uh, much more time. Therefore, relying on traditions and looking into the future, I think this will be a universal principle. In conclusion, I would like to share my impression. I think that Konstantin mentioned that countries train universal bureaucrats rather than universal uh, diplomats. Maybe that's the investment of the Russian government into training special uh, bureaucrats, and uh, this will be diplomats for special countries with the knowledge of area studies, with the language of uh, with the knowledge of languages, special knowledge as well. And uh, then they will uh, eliminate the disbalance in material resources, which we have with some countries. We studied uh, the budgets, so military budgets of the key of major 20 countries. And as to the coefficient of the use of uh, um, these expenses uh, from the point of view of initiatives and influence, our, uh, our industry um, overtakes the uh, colleagues in Europe and even in the United States. Uh, this is the expenses per head of a diplomat. And uh, these figures are very important. Uh, they are quite significant. So I understand you can't find an ideal department. I would like to express thanks to our distinguished speakers. It was my great pleasure to moderate this session. Now I invite you all to the coffee break. But uh, before that, let's thank our colleagues for their outstanding contributions.
Dear colleagues, I would suggest resuming our work. So, our present session is a continuation of the previous one. My name is Igor Denisov, and I am a senior fellow of the Institute of International Research of MGIMO. And our special session was dedicated to the matters of universal diplomacy or universal diplomats. Uh, so I would say a universal warrior or soldier in some way, because sometimes diplomats are on a minefield and uh, such a minefield uh, is the Pacific region, for example. And our topic is uh, the US, Russia and China in the Pacific region. Uh, is there a new confrontation? So this is a question because we have more uncertainty here answering this question. We don't know what is to come in the relations of the US and China, for example. And in the Pacific region, the interests of the US and China are concentrated more and intertwined more than anywhere else. But I would like to remind you of the of June uh, of 2013. So the leaders of the two countries met and the Chinese leader said that the Pacific Ocean is big enough to have both the US and China there. Now we see some confrontation in the uh, relations of the countries and now it has become global and includes not only uh, economic matters, but also ideological and value matters. So we have quite a good panel for our session, and I hope that we will come to some, we will close to, uh, to uh, be, uh, we will be closer to uh, define the uh, horizon of uncertainty in the Pacific region. Our first presenter is uh, uh, Mr. Tsi Huai Gao. He, he is the Vice Dean of the Institute of International Research of the Fudan uh, University in Shanghai. Mr. Tsi is a specialist in the relations uh, of China with neighbors, and he has quite a number of publications in uh, international relations uh, in the region, and it's very pleasant that uh, he is one of the contributors of our journal, International Analytics, and last year, for example, he published there an article on the changes in the international situation in uh, Asia. According to him, the major task of China is to avoid a new Cold War with the US and to reach a balance of forces with Washington. And so he speaks about two superpowers and three uh, regional powers, uh, those of Russia, South Korea and Japan. And I would like to invite him to share his ideas on the situation in the Pacific uh, region um, under today's conditions with the new president in Washington. So uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Tsi. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? And can you see my shared PPT? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, the uh, moderator, uh, Mr. Ego. Denis uh, thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, my presentation is uh, on the topic of China-U.S. cooperation and uh, competition in the Northeast Asia, implications for the diplomacy of the NEA states in the 2020s. I will mainly focus on three questions. The first question, how to define China-U.S. relations in Northeast Asia. Second question, what foreign policy adjustments will the NEA states make in light of the new normal of China-U.S. relations? The third question, what are China's strategic choices for NEA in the next decade? 
So my contents will mainly focus on mainly focus on to uh, how to quest, how to answer the three mentioned questions. First, China U.S. cooperation and competition in Northeast Asia. How to define China U.S. relations? The two countries have different values. From the Chinese side, the main characteristic is, is emphasizing cooperation. For example, in this November, Chinese President Xi Jinping have a virtual meeting, virtual meeting with U.S. President Biden. She said, respect each other coexistence in peace and pursue win-win cooperation. She also said, harness the dialogue channels and the mechanisms between the diplomatic and the security, economic and the financial, and the climate change teams in an effort to advance practical cooperation and resolve specific issues. The uh, Yang Jiechi, the director of uh, China's uh, uh, Foreign Affairs Commission of C C C C P Central Commission. Uh, when he met with the U.S. National Advisor Sullivan in this October, Yang said that China opposes defining China-U.S. relations as competitive. But how U.S. define? the two countries' relations. U.S. side, the many fo focus on competition, emphasizing competition. For example, when Biden have a, had, had a virtual meeting with President Xi uh, in this November, Biden said uh, the two countries' relations can be defined a uh, straightforward competition. Biden also said to ensure that the competition between the two countries does not veer into conflict. Sullivan, U.S. National Advisor, National Security Advisor, said uh, put forward a responsible competition with China. The Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State, mentioned that the uh, U.S. should uh, engage China from a position of strength. I, I remember that uh, Blinken also said the uh, U.S. should uh, engage Russia from position of strength. Why China and the U.S. have different views on the definition of their bilateral relations? The main reason is the power structure in Northeast Asia and beyond. It show a weakening unipolarity of the US and a rapid rise of China. I, uh, I draw this, pic this photo uh, in an article published in the Journal of International Analytics, just as uh, uh, Mr. Eagle Deni Denisov mentioned that. Before, so I uh, used uh, uh, some uh, four four kinds of data to describe the power structure. Uh, I I used a formula uh, with that formula T T means time equals population plus ecology plus technology plus military, and then divided by four. So we can see that uh, from 1990 to 2018, uh, China's national comprehensive national power is approaching the US, and uh, which also show a weakening unipolarity of the US. Uh, next, I will talk about the cooperation fields in East Asia, the Northeast Asia and beyond. 
there are some fears that both China and the US can cooperate with each other. For example, combating infectious diseases such as COVID-19, etc. Preventing financial crisis, responding to climate change. For example, in this, uh, in this year, China and US uh, jointly published a, uh, an action uh, titled China US Joint Glasgow Declaration on Enhancing Climate Action in the 2020s. Preventing the spread of nuclear weapons, especially in, in Northeast Asia region, and achieving lasting peace on the Korean, Korean Peninsula, for example, to uh, to get to reach an end of war declaration on the Korean Peninsula. At the same time, there are some competition fields in Northeast Asia and beyond. For example, uh, the maritime maritime confrontation or maritime competition in West Pacific region. In the 18th Chinese Communist Party Congress, China for, put forward to, to be a maritime power. Uh, so the US saw this as a challenge to, to its maritime hegemony. Uh, second, China, China uh, is uh, putting forward a multilateral partnership with uh, all the country, all the countries in the world. At the same time, U.S. Uh, uh, still insists on its bilateral alliances, which was uh, uh, constructed in the Cold War period. Uh, for example. The bilateral alliance with uh, Japan, with uh, South Korea, with uh, Australia. Uh, third, China. In nineteen in twenty thirteen, Chinese government uh, put forward the BRT BRI initiative, B Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, in twenty seventeen, the U.S. put forward Indo-Pacific strategy. If the U.S. used the Indo-Pacific strategy, strategy as a tool to interfere with the BRI and even contain China, China will oppose it. On the Taiwan issue, which is a very hot topic between China-U.S. relations, from, from the perspective of China, China won't peaceful reunification of Taiwan. At the same time, Chinese President Xi said that the, the separatist forces for Taiwan independence provoke us, we will be compelled to take rest, resolute measures. The US attitude on Taiwan question is uh, committing to the one China policy. But at the same time, it emphasized the, the Taiwan Relations Act. It also, the U.S. also mentioned this, strongly opposing unilateral efforts to change the status quo across the Taiwan Strait. So there are some different views on the Taiwan question. So uh, China-U.S. relations can be Describe it as a new normal, which means cooperation to combat global challenges while competing competition in some in some fields. Second, I will briefly introduction the foreign policy adjustment of Northeast Asia states. Russia. Firstly, uh, I'd like to talk about Russia. Russia's foreign policy adjustment, in my opinion, uh, is a kind of balance between China and the US. 
Russia has uh, traditionally focused its diplomatic efforts on Europe. Uh, but since uh, 2010, um, the Russia's uh, the profile of the AEA region in Russian foreign policy has risen considerably. Russia will likely maintain a maximum balance in the China-US competition. Russia also will develop its strategic partnership with China, and which is in Russia's best interest. Russia will probably try to restart relations with the US, but it's not easy. The main reason is the, the hostility of the US political elites toward Russia. Russia will also develop relations with the EU countries, India and Japan, etc. Russia will actively promote economic cooperation in Northeast Asia and use the investment from other NEA states to develop its Far East region. Second, Japan, Japan's foreign policy adjustment, adjustment uh, I describe it uh, remaining high flex, flexible. Japan will try to remain highly flexible on its NEA strategic choice. Japan is expected to continue to maintain its alliance with the US while trying to maintain good relations with China in the 2020s. South Korea, South Korea will uh, search for autonomy, especially in the competition between US and China uh, in order to enhance uh, South Korea's strategic autonomy. And the South Korea will try to put forward initiatives for the NEA regime and even broader regions. North Korea's foreign policy adjustment, uh, I describe it as pursuing, pursuing national security. North Korea is primarily interested in ensure national security, but its strategy has shifted from military first politics to economic construction. It's uh, many benefited from the uh, situation. Uh, situation has started to ease somewhat since 2018. Uh, Mongolia, Mongolia's foreign, pol foreign policy adjustment I describe it as developing with third neighbors. Mongolia's third, the third neighbors, uh, including uh, US, Germany, and Japan, uh, South Korea, etc. So, uh, in Mongolia's perspective, China and Russia is uh, are, are Mongolia's two main neighbors and uh, to uh, have a bigger autonomy. Mongolia will uh, develop relation, relations, develop relations with uh, the third states. The last part, I will briefly in, talk about China's strategic choices for NEA in the 2020s. First, China will try to avoid a new Cold War and achieve a strategic balance with the US in the NEA region. Second, China will always maintain a friendly and close strategic partnership with Russia. China and Russia share common interests in resisting American unipolar, unipolar hegemony as well as support each other in events involving their respective national interests. China will take into account Russia's concerns as much as possible when developing relations with Central Asia countries. Third, China will actively promote economic cooperation with the other NEA states. I listed some economic cooperation 
institutions such as the development of Russia, Far East, China, Mongolia, Russia Economic Corridor, negotiations on the China Japan South Korea Free Trade Zone, China Japan South Korea Plus X cooperation. To integrate North Korea into the economic cooperation process in Northeast Asia. First, China will promote the establishment of the of a regional security mechanism that includes all the NEA states. Uh, for example, uh, to establish a Northeast Asia Peace and Cooperation Organization, uh, I borrowed it from uh, Tonara, Tonaraya. Uh, I think uh, Tonaraya is maybe a Russia scholar. Members can include China, Japan, North Korea, South Korea, Mongolia, Russia, and the US. Uh, I also listed some uh, uh, references of my presentation. Uh, I, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Спасибо большое, господин Ти. Вы дали... Мистер Ти, you have offered a review of US-China relations, which are symbiosis of cooperation, of competition and confrontation. And you have described the structure which is now emerging in the Northeast Asia as a result of the China-US confrontation. The subject will be continued by my colleague, uh, in the Institute of International Research, Andrei Baklitsky, Baklitsky. Andrei Alexandrovich is a research fellow of the Institute of International Research of American Studies. He's a specialist in the sphere of arms control, non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, and international security. In one of the recent interviews, Andrew mentioned that if uh, there is a confrontation in the future between uh, the US and uh, China and the US and Russia. Uh, there will be a huge potential for escalation, especially at the nuclear uh, level. This is a very tall uh, order, but he also expressed his uh, hope that uh, the leaders will not allow uh, things to develop like this. So from your point of view, Andrew, what are the prospects of the US-China confrontation? Will it reach a hot stage around Taiwan, for example? And what is the preferable choice into the foreign policy of Russia? Dear colleagues, I would like to ask you all not to uh, break the time, 10, uh, the 10 minutes limit. And you prepare, you can prepare your questions. We hope to have the questions and answers session later on. And uh, if you are watching us in Zoom online, you can ask your questions in chat and I will read them out. And uh, for the members here, you, can all, you will also be able to ask questions or to make brief comments. Thank you, you, and thank you for inviting me to speak on the subject. As it was mentioned, I'm a specialist on the nuclear questions on the issues of the US-Russia relations. But it's obvious that nowadays the factor of China influences all spheres of our life. Therefore, today I will speak on the subject of the view of the situation from Russia. And there are four ideas which I would like to articulate. First, what the confrontation between the US and China look like, what's the role of Russia, what are the consequences for Russia in this sphere, and what could be the interests of Russia in this context. I will start by claiming that the confrontation between China and the US is for a long time, and there is a consensus in the US, and the change of administration only confirmed it. Uh, Biden, uh, Biden's administration and Trump's administration policy here is uh, probably identical. And uh, one cannot ignore it in any of the spheres by neither by either of the countries. Because uh, the, con the confrontation between these two powers is very important for the whole world. We do not quite understand what kind of confrontation it's going to be and what uh, what uh, a victory could look like. But we must understand that there are elements of this confrontation. So the balance in the Asian Pacific region has changed in favor of China. 
in September 2020, Pentagon recognized uh, that uh, the uh, Chinese uh, Navy exceeded the American Navy from the point of view of the number of vessels and uh, the um, vessel building uh, capacity of China is great. Therefore, as far as the capacity, China will uh, exceed uh, the US too. A great number of uh, uh, missiles, including cruise missiles. So this is changing the balance of forces in this region. And uh, the, the region where China will act if there is a crisis. Uh, it's understandable that China will not be interested in waging a war on the territory of the United States. China will use its military forces next to, its, uh, to the continental uh, area. The US is trying to balance either by changing its uh, direct military planning and modifying its military forces, uh, like the Marine Corps is uh, being modernized at the moment uh, for them to be prepared for possible operations in uh, the Asian Pacific region. And alliances are building. We mentioned AUKUS today, and uh, the well-known Marines, uh, the nuclear Marines, uh, which, were, which were mentioned. Now, the question is, uh, what's the Russian, uh, what, what is Russia's place here? Russia is not a formal ally of uh, China. We must underline and remind you of this. But uh, we have active cooperation with China. Uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin in 2019 characterized our relations as the relations of allies uh, and uh, strategic partnership, uh, membership in the Shanghai Organization together. And uh, also uh, the relations between Russia and the US are also very tense. And it's understandable that if we watch this, if we have this uh, confrontation between Russia and the US, we don't participate in the confrontation between China and the US. We don't participate, but we are closer to being uh, on China's side. And we supply weapons to China, 70% of the um, Chinese import uh, falls on Russian um, export. Uh, there's an um, anti-missile um, installations, and even uh, US sanctions uh, did not uh, hinder this process. Besides, uh, uh, Russia is uh, helping uh, China to build uh, early awareness systems. And uh, we must also mention here that uh, there are joint exercises regularly together, land, uh, marine, uh, on the sea, aviation, and two times uh, strategic aviation was used, uh, strategic bombers, uh, yes, uh, which maneuver in uh, the space of the Asia-Pacific uh, region. So if you don't uh, uh, describe it as an alliance, uh, this is very close uh, to the alliance. Uh, how does uh, the confrontation in Asia look like from the uh, Russia, from Russia's point of view? So besides two poles, US and China, uh, we should say here that uh, you, uh, China has territorial claims practically to all its neighbors. So territorial uh, situations uh, with, uh, the, with uh, Vietnam, the Philippines, uh, Brunei, India, and others. And also the de facto st status of Taiwan has not been has not been regulated. Some of these countries are U.S. allies. Those who are not allies still look up to um, China to to the U.S. And uh, the United States is pursuing its policy with uh, the participation of India, not an ally. Uh, now there is also the AUKUS uh, format with the participation of uh, Great Britain, uh, Australia, and the US. And uh, the US is increasing the military uh, might of its allies. I mentioned uh, the technology, uh, transfer of technology to Australia, uh, re uh, which is uh, a very new tendency. Before that, it only happened with the UK. There is also um, active uh, cooperation in uh, increasing uh, the um, capacity of uh, South Korean missile systems uh, with Japan, anti-missile uh, systems. Uh, this is a joint project with uh, between Japan and the US. Besides, the US is trying to use uh, other alliances, strengthen its presence, um, the presence of NATO. In 2019, Washington managed to add Beijing to the London Declaration of the NATO countries. It was rather elusive 
but uh, it also mentioned that NATO also deals with the problem of China, though it's understandable that uh, the Warsaw Treaty doesn't provide for any threat from China. And uh, we also saw operations uh, with the freedom of the sea, with the participation of the French Navy, German Navy in uh, the uh, South China Sea. So uh, what influence does it have uh, for uh, Russia? Russia is not interested in uh, uh, the US allies growing capacity in this region and uh, the Australian submarines, though at the moment uh, this is an abstract problem, but when they are constructed, Australia will have more nuclear submarines than Russia in uh, this um, region. And though we're not going to fight Australia, but still, uh, why have so many nuclear submarines there? And if Australia has uh, these nuclear submarines, uh, it's possible that South Korea would also like to have uh, similar marines uh, and uh, Japan. And uh, they are very close to our region. region. And uh, we remember that we have uh, unregulated territorial uh, problems with Japan. So this also is going to affect uh, uh, the security of Russia. Besides, uh, rebalancing of uh, the U.S. forces uh, to Asia and uh, deploying uh, medium-range missiles in Asia, which uh, the U.S. admits they are all uh, aimed against China, but uh, we also have a territory in this area, our Far East and our uh, Pacific fleet uh, can be affected too. And uh, uh, again, for Russia, it will be very dangerous uh, if this confrontation turns into um, real hostilities. This will be destructive for the military economy because there are nuclear weapons there. And uh, God forbid, if anything happens there, it's going to affect us. So we do not want in any way for this crisis uh, to become a real crisis. Uh, and uh, we would like to contribute to make sure it doesn't happen uh, like this. Uh, but uh, the factors here are sometimes beyond our um, possibility. So what uh, are the interests of Russia in this context? I will mention a few ideas. First, uh, containing the United States in this region is in keeping with Russia's interests. And here, Russia and China are facing the same challenges. Uh, this is uh, the uh, anti-missile system of the United States, uh, this, um, space weapons, uh, and uh, um, in conventional, the superiority of the US in conventional weapons and uh, taking into account uh, uh, right the Navy and the freedom of uh, um, sea transportation. Uh, these are the problems uh, facing China and Russia. These are common challenges. And here with China, we can look for common solutions. Also containing uh, NATO in uh, this region. We don't need NATO in this region, enough for us in Europe. At the same time, Russia is not interested in the territorial uh, disputes between China and uh, its neighbors. We have our territorial dispute with, with Japan, that's enough for us. Uh, uh, the export of uh, weapons to China uh, for Russia is beneficial, should be continued, uh, but uh, we should also continue the export of weapons to other countries of the region, which I think is a, a correct approach. Now, uh, joint military exercises, I would, I would prefer them uh, to be uh, conducted against the US, not uh, the uh, neighboring countries, uh, because we see the US planes flights uh, close to the US, close to our borders. It would be a good idea to have similar flights of our uh, planes towards uh, the US territory. Uh, Guam, for example, why not uh, send our our planes to that um, to those borders as well? Now, uh, as I am a researcher of uh, the Institute of International Relations, therefore, by my job, by default, I must remember history of relations. And here you remember at the time of Catherine II and Paul II, there was such an idea as armed neutrality to, at the time of post-revolutionary wars by France. And this armed neutrality can be quite friendly in nature, friendly towards one of the sides. So during the War of Independence, this armed uh, of the United States, so that was friendly towards the US. But Russia didn't participate in any hostilities. The main idea was to, to preserve trade, free, uh, free maritime trade. 
and uh, uh, you, uh, adapting it to the present realities, uh, I would say that the key idea here is as follows. We don't want the confrontation between China and the US uh, to interfere with uh, the life of other countries of this region. I think that uh, there may be good support for this idea among Asian countries. Because uh, they, they also have, uh, they, they feel they have to choose either China or the US. And therefore, I think that uh, another alternative was offered, another initiative was offered. It uh, would be received with uh, quite beneficially in this region. So the question is what we can offer here. And I think the time is good for this initiative. Thank you, Andrei, for such an informative presentation. Uh, I would like to mention here what you have also mentioned, that there are no benchmarks of a victory in the uh, current situation between the US and China. And I would also add here that, uh, besides, we do not see any horizon, any terms for this situation. And this is something that makes uh, the situation very unpredictable for Russia. And uh, thank you for mentioning uh, Russia's interests in the region, uh, because I'm also quite skeptical when it comes to uh, the flights aimed against Japan. I'm not sure uh, that uh, we should do anything of that kind, but at least I understand that uh, it makes us more cautious uh, when uh, discussing the matters of different alliances in the region. So we, I think that we should not exacerbate the situation. This is my opinion, my position on that. And I would like to listen Michael Kaufman, who is uh, a senior fellow researcher of the Canon Institute. He's a specialist in uh, Russia defense policy and the US policy in security matters. And I, while preparing for our today's session, uh, resaw, revisited uh, an interview of Michael uh, and uh, Andrei Sushinsov, where Michael said that the situation makes Russia participate in this confrontation against the United States. So the only thing I would disagree that the investment in the Navy and the Army in China uh, creates a situation where Ahem is looking for uh, nails. So I would say that the Chinese military still have some voice in the situation. And speaking of making Russia uh, uh, enter an alliance with China, so speaking of that situation, what do you think now, Michael? Uh, thank you very much, Michael. I'm now trying hard to remember what I really said in this interview uh, with Andrei Sushinsov. So I'm not that well prepared as our moderator, but I would like to say to Andrei that the first submarines that you have mentioned uh, in the region bought by Australia will be present in the region only by 2013, so uh, 30. So in this respect, uh, Russia should not worry about that. This is some kind of delayed task. So speaking of the Minister of Defense, usually uh, a Ministry of Defense with a huge budget is this exact uh, exact metaphor of a hammer looking for nails. And uh, speaking of the agenda, the general strategy of the US towards China can be defined as a strategic competition. So many think that it will be present, it will come in the shape of a containment of China 
So Europe is the second theater of action for the U.S. in this respect in comparison with the Pacific region or in the Pacific region. So Europe is no huge weight in international politics now. And I think that our pivot towards China makes China the first priority of the United States, uh, especially in the economic terms. Uh, Russia is also making its pivot towards China in its policy. So there are two tragedies in life. The first is when you can't get what you want, and the second then, uh, is when you get it, finally. In this respect, I, uh, I'm not sure that we uh, should be jealous of uh, China in the future. If we speak about comparisons with the Cold War times, uh, they're quite pragmatic, I would say, but there are nuances because Uh, in English, we can say it's not the Cold War, so uh, the exact period of time, but a Cold War. So, in other words, it's a new type of something like a Cold War uh, in the relations of powers. And we hope that uh, if we have any war at all, then it'll be cold. So, uh, when we make historical comparisons, uh, we usually forget that there was quite an economic integration between the USSR and the Warsaw Pact countries. So then between the USSR, for example, and the US. And so the key Warsaw Pact countries were part of this integration. So, and I wouldn't make any stake here because we are not going to have such deep economic integration in the future. In my opinion, China is a country, is a power with uh, territorial uh, disputes with India, uh, Taiwan and other neighbors, uh, with perhaps the only exception of Russia. When such a power is growing in military and economic terms and still has some territorial disputes with almost all its neighbors, this is not quite a positive trend, I would say. If we speak about making alliances or blocks, then the bright cooperation of Russia and China makes us also enter new alliances with Japan, for example, or other countries, we are going to see what kind of evolution these blocks will experience. But again, in comparison with the past, uh, competition is now much fiercer than it used to be in the 20th century in the region. If we speak about the changes in the world, I'm not sure that I can describe it as bipolar, multipolar. The US has a structural advantage, which is uh, sometimes undervalued by experts. So despite all these multipolar, bipolar discussions, so this is not the point. The point is the weight power uh, a power has. So in other words, the ability of a power to control and dictate certain developments in the world. So, of course, we cannot speak about the hegemony of the US anymore, but we uh, can say the same thing about Russia or China. So, multipolarity is quite a difficult question to discuss, and it's really difficult to uh, say in advance what kind of structural advantages other countries will have in the future. So, but First, we should speak here about the such advantages in technologies, of course, because this is the key uh, factor of success, and technologies actually dictate whose part to take in different conflicts. There is a discussion in the United States as to what kind of conflict it is in reality, in nature. 
So whether it's a conflict about the influence in uh, the region, uh, whether it's uh, uh, an economic uh, conflict or whether it's a value-centered conflict. And this discussion uh, has been heated for many years already. So we cannot say that there is no ideology behind this competition. This is not true. And lots of people in Washington are discussing this in quite a serious manner. So this is a matter of uh, perhaps the conflict of dem uh, a democratic approach to anti-democratic approach, or it can be described in different way, but still this question should be discussed because there is no direct answer to this. So now I'm winding up and uh, I would uh, uh, make my apologies for my style because this is my second night uh, in Moscow without sleep. I, uh, so I can't sleep because of jet lag. Uh, the last point I would like to make here is the military uh, competition between the countries. So I wouldn't say that China's Navy is developing in such a good way, because if we speak about the efficiency and the quality of the military forces, uh, so the, the US still has an advantage here. Uh, besides, it has quite a number of allies, so South Korea and Japan, and uh, our capacity in this respect, of course, is advantageous. And the military practice is also of importance here, and as far as I understand, again, the U.S. has an advantage here. So here I'm winding up. Thank you very much, Michael. Despite your lack of sleep, it's been a good presentation. And thank you for mentioning India, for example, because this is quite a factor for Russia as well. We're trying to balance, uh, to, to find some balance points um, in our relations with China and India. So speaking of our relations, for example, with India, then uh, sometimes with, we export uh, arms to India uh, that are different from those that uh, we are exporting to other countries. So if we speak about territorial disputes of China, I would say that it's not about ter territories as they are. It's more about uh, expanding technologies. Our next presenter is Andrei Lankov. He is a professor of the Cook Min University in the Republic of Korea. Uh, we saw each other uh, with Andre in Seoul in 2016. So it was a CNN cafe, as far as, far as I remember, and that was quite a moment in history because uh, there were elections, presidential elections in uh, the US. And uh, uh, after my return to Moscow, I learned that the new uh, president of the United States was Trump. And now let us speak about uh, US-China relations in the, from the perspective of South Korea. So has it become a, an internal political factor for South Korea. So next year we'll see a new president in the country. And in terms of its relations with uh, China and the US, so what is the situation now? Uh, of course, it has become a political factor, but not in the meaning that you mean in a different one. It's not a matter of global po politics or policy. So today in the press, I've seen some news about the discussion between counselors, advisors uh, from the competing parties in South Korea. So between the left wing 
and the right uh, conservative wing parties. I know both the people and I'm quite surprised to see them in their current capacities because uh, they can be actually interchangeable. But and they are not very different in their views. But what they discussed yesterday, the results of this discussion, appeared today in today's press, and it shows that the differences in foreign policy issues is not big between the two wings of political parties in South Korea. Speaking of the situation in South Korea and the Korean Peninsula, the US-China conflict, uh, I think, is going to be a long-term conflict. Uh, and I cannot say for sure how much time it's going to take, but still it's going to last for a while. So what kind of influence does it have on the peninsula? So uh, here I would speak about three factors. So I would start with uh, Northern Korea. Uh, their elite is very westernized in their uh, habits and consumerism, but when Pyongyang learned about the conflict between the US and China, they opened all bottles of champagne they had because the news uh, is quite favorable for North Korea, uh, North Korea. In Beijing, there has always been an ambiguous, uh, ambiguous uh, attitude of uh, China towards Pyongyang. So on the one hand, China finds it good when there is stability in the Korean Peninsula because the border is very close and it's important. On the other hand, quite a lot of things that the government of North Korea has done uh, makes China quite uh, irritable because, first of all, it, uh, it, it is uh, the problem of the nuclear program in North Korea and some other political issues. And in the new situation, everything has become very clear because there is no... Uh, because now the situation is such that they are on, in the same boat, so to speak. And there are lots of issues they have to solve together. So the major task for China is to preserve status quo in the peninsula. So it is important for China to have the peninsula stable and divided, as always. And in 2017, China voted for quite serious sanctions against North Korea that amounted to a blockage, China actually make, make, made the uh, sanctions uh, possible in 2017. Now, China is sus uh, sustaining the delivery of food to North Korea of liquid fuel, and so the idea of China now is to support North Korea uh, floating. With, without any overthinking of what uh, North Korea is doing at the moment. So China makes it possible for North Korea just to do something without making any serious steps. Despite the fact that North Korea's government has warned the world community that they are going to uh, violate their moratorium that the country took in 2017, the moratorium 
on launching ballistic missiles and nuclear tests. So North Korea has threatened they are going to violate the moratorium, but they haven't violated it yet. So uh, what the government of North Korea understands now is that there is no famine in the uh, country thanks to China's efforts. So, and they are not going to make any reforms. So in other words, they have come to a stable situation. So what is happening in South Korea? And I'm coming back to the original question. Things which are happening there are quite unexpected. When back in 2016, we were sitting in the CNN cafe and during your previous visit, if you had asked me then whether this, this is possible, I would have been very skeptical. So things which are happening now are very interesting. A, a very fast surge of anti-China sentiment in South Korea. Before 2016, 2017, up to the situation when anti-missile system SAD were deployed in South Korea, which created, which resulted in a special, in a serious crisis between China and South Korea. Before that situation, the attitude was neutral and positive. Very few of the neighbors of China had such a calm attitude towards China. But things have changed very fast. The anti-China sentiment is growing. And you can feel it from conversations, from mass media, and statistics proves it. Public opinion surveys prove it. If you look at the public opinion polls, you see that in 2002, only 31% of people had a negative sentiment towards China. But last year, in 2020, 75% responded in this way. So less than 20 years, but the number of people doubled. Moreover, and this is surprising, in the recent years, in the public opinion polls, it is China, which is shown as the uh, most disliked nation by South Koreans. And here it even ousted Japan, eh? because Japan for decades was the main enemy. And uh, also the age uh, criterion is important here. The younger a person is, the more negative attitude towards China he practices. And uh, uh, simultaneously, in South Korea, the pro-American sentiment has always been very strong for the political elite and for the population in, uh, at large. So this pro-American sentiment has increased. So anti-China anti sentiment is growing and the pro-US sentiment is increasing as well. Maybe not so fast, but uh, um, uh, that's true. But is it a political issue? And here some considerations are interesting. I would say that rather yes than no. So to a certain extent, uh, this is a pro uh, question of a consensus. If the conservative conservatives now uh, win the election, then the present moderate left uh, nationalist uh, nationalist bloc, I'm not sure that they are going to use the anti. Uh, American and pro-Chinese uh, card. There is a possibility, but uh, this is just a possibility, but you cannot criticize the government <clears throat> to follow to follow Washington uh, very radically. But even here, I'm, I'm not sure of this statement. The impression at present is as follows, that the position and the, the ruling party <clears throat> at present, uh, which traditionally have been anti-American to a great extent. People in uh, the Blue House, in the youth, uh, they burned American flags and, and said negative things about uh, the Uncle Sam, about Uncle Sam. But now they and their opponents take a rather apprehensive attitude towards China, though don't want to quarrel with China directly, don't want to be involved in a conflict, though the empathy is more on the, on the US side more and more. At the same time, the foreign policy issue 
with the exception of North Korea issue. So political issues here are not uh, the subject of the serious uh, disagreement between uh, the two political uh, camps in South Korea. And uh, here, one more uh, issue here. So against the background of the uh, surging anti-China sentiment in South Korea, which is uh, rather new, so against this backdrop, uh, we are witnessing uh, the reduction of the anti-Japan, anti-Japanese sentiment, which was characteristic for South Korea for decades, and uh, which was fueled uh, by the elites and by the counter elites uh, as uh, uh, a kind of mobilizing uh, the population. Thus, uh, we are witnessing uh, that a new configuration is emerging of political forces, uh, more clear-cut uh, than in the past decades. I would say that uh, uh, North Eastern, uh, North Eastern Asia, for us, uh, it is some. We believe it is somewhere in the Chukotsk region, but uh, in uh, Asia they believe that uh, this is Korea and Japan. So this region is moving towards local bipolarity. So two blocks are emerging: China, uh, North Korea on the one side, and uh, South Korea, uh, Japan, the U.S. on the other side. It is too early to say, to give any predictions, but uh, there will be a higher coordination between Japan and South Korea. But uh, like they say, in, uh, um, Odessa will uh, live and see. But uh, uh, these tendencies are obvious. At the same time, we should remember that uh, North Korea and China, these relations, uh, have uh, some uh, underwater, uh, underwater uh, barriers. Uh, this is uh, the um, marriage uh, by agreement. So North, North Korea will probably try to leave uh, the zone of influence between um, China and try to maybe uh, use uh, the uh, contradictions between China and South and the, uh, the US and probably will try to move closer to the United States and Pyongyang. They have had this dream for, for some time, but uh, the union with uh, China is not very reliable. The relations between uh, South Korea, uh, Japan and the US here, the uh, uh, relations are more stable, but uh, uh, there is also a consensus of certain uh, of political parties in these countries when they say that uh, Americans are good guys uh, and the uh, Chinese are bad guys, but, uh, but uh, to be openly involved in the conflict between China and the US, these countries will be very um, reluctant to do that. So this is my view. Uh, thank you. Thank you. You have provided a very interesting view of what is happening in South Korea, rather unexpected shift for us and for me too. I did not, I could not forecast such a development even two or three years ago. Uh, at the time I prepared a report on relations between South Korea, Korea and China. But uh, uh, I could witness uh, the beginning at that time, but I, I thought it was just uh, a very light trend. Uh, so, but it all started in 2016, 2017. There are reasons for that, but you did not give me time to talk about the reasons. I have a general understanding about uh, the ideas which provoked this trend, but I think the response was uh, uh, too strong. Thank you. We have uh, already violated our time limit. Probably we will not start uh, the questions and answers session. I will just summarize. I do not believe in the new bipolarity in this region. I don't know whether Michael will agree with me. I think that the alliances uh, will be uh, rather movable. And then uh, we remember what uh, Andrew said about Russia's position. It's not. Uh, unilaterally pro-China, and as to our military and technological 
cooperation will develop it with other countries as well, other countries of the region. So most probably in the region there will be two leaders which will compete, but other countries will choose their partners depending on individual interests, sometimes joining one camp and in other instances joining the other camp. I don't know, know whether we made the situation in the Pacific area clear by our discussion, but that's the way we see it at the moment. Thank you all. Yes, so let's say, uh, express, let's thank our speakers.
Сергей, Сергей да, ну, участник, он не выступает. Да. <coughs> Уважаемые коллеги. Нет, коллегс. Нет, это все работает, все нормально. Dear colleagues, welcome to our third session devoted to the subject Europe in search of a new course. Even if, if you a few years ago we started a session on Europe after lunch, we would have lost our audience, everybody would fall asleep, because at that time we believed Europe was not that important in international relations. Now the situation, I believe, has changed. I believe it has changed, but we'll see what the participants think on the subject. I think there are two reasons, though actually there are more than two. The first is that the US-China confrontation and the shift or the pivot of the center of interest into the Asia-Pacific Ocean uh, creates uh, many uh, questions and challenges for the Europeans, but uh, that's not all. Traditionally, when we talk about Europe, we talk about uh, the uh, standoff between old Europe and new Europe, East Europeans, who in many instances, especially in relations with Russia, set a new agenda. But, uh, I believe uh, that uh, we have not probably understood the new agenda, which I think is very important. What is very important is that uh, Germany is uh, uh, swinging to the left. The political specter is swinging to the left, uh, meaning the coalition government, those who are going to run Germany. And in France, uh, there is a shift to the right. So two main focuses of uh, <clears throat> influence uh, in Europe are drifting apart. This is my uh, opinion, uh, but uh, our participants uh, can express different uh, uh, views. We have uh, an outstanding group of experts today, and uh, uh, Peter Teschendorf, uh, head of the, uh, for the uh, Friedrich Ebert Foundation in Russia, Rafael Marchetti, a pro professor from the Lewis University. Artem Sokolov uh, is a research fellow of the Institute of International Research of the MGMO University. My old friend and colleague, Simtek, the founder and the leading analyst of the forest analysis from Belgium. And uh, uh, yes, I wanted to say my old friend, uh, but Michael is always uh, very young, but uh, uh, old timer, um, leading research fellow of the Center of uh, Military um, Maritime Analysis, a scientific uh, uh, research of the Institute named after Kennan, uh, the International Center uh, named after uh, Woodrow Wilson, the United States. And... Uh, the time limit is the same, dear colleagues, after lunch. So you all have 10 minutes at your disposal to make sure that we leave some time for questions and answers and for discussion. And uh, Mr. Teschendorf, Peter Teschendorf, you are the first. Okay, thank you. I will try to be fast because our discussion is uh, most interesting. As uh, it was noted uh, already uh, yesterday, we, we selected or elected a new government. And uh, for me, as a member of this party, uh, to say that uh, for the fourth time, uh, we have uh, as a chancellor, a social democrat. And uh, the coalition is very interesting. Uh, that's a coalition for the first time of three parties at the federal level. And uh, it will be for everyone an interesting experiment. Uh, the first test was successful for them. So discussion of the agreement uh, took place rather fast. And uh, they have managed to uh, negotiate and uh, not to leak uh, any information about the discussions, which, us which usually happens regularly. But this time, yes, there were no leaks. They discussed, they carried out the discussion 
uh, in a confidential atmosphere and uh, elaborated a kind of agreement among them. And if we look at the international relations and the election campaign, so it was uh, international politics was not very important uh, for the election campaign. What was more important uh, were domestic issues, pre uh, fighting the pandemic, uh, the economic development, again in, in the against the backdrop uh, of the pandemic, uh, climate change, uh, Europe is uh, uh, interested in uh, the subject. Also, uh, the working group uh, focused on foreign policy as well, on defense as well, a special group on humanitarian issues and human rights. So there was one group which focused on uh, uh, these issues, and there was another group which focused on uh, one issue, Europe. The agreement focused on Europe. And uh, if we compare other foreign policy issues, we see that uh, they are more specific, more concrete. Uh, people from European Parliament participated in that work and uh, the ideas there were very specific. So the main idea is uh, the strategic sovereignty of the European Union. I would uh, say that uh, this word uh, was repeated again and again throughout uh, the agreement. The policy of the future government uh, will be aimed at uh, strengthening uh, the uh, possibility of action in the global context. It was noted that uh, the US uh, foreign policy goes in a slightly different direction, pivoting towards uh, Asia. It started uh, under President Obama. And uh, under President Trump, Europe came to understand uh, that uh, they uh, uh, would stay on their own. And uh, hence, hence uh, the concept of strategic uh, autonomy emerged. Uh, though, uh, of course, such importance as uh, uh, health care and energy issues uh, are of special importance, uh, and also import of energy sources, uh, digital technologies. Uh, here, uh, cooperation in this field uh, is uh, going to, to intensify. Uh, cre creating joint uh, companies, joint products, and the resilience will be strengthened as well. So uh, the, uh, also uh, providing providing a protection against misinformation, disinformation. This agreement of the coalition government also included uh, the desire to strengthen natural joint policy in the field of foreign policy and the po security policy, as well as the defense policy. So that uh, the United, uh, European Union should act uh, in a more united vo uh, front and speak with one voice. Specific items include common foreign and security policy and uh, using not consensus principle, uh, but a qualified majority, two thirds majority. This is a, a, a grandiose plan and uh, we'll see how successful they will be. Diplomacy is to be, European diplomacy is to be strengthened and uh, also the need to have uh, a full-fledged foreign minister. It's also uh, creating a European army. A joint command for this European army. And also uh, joint headquarters, including civilian headquarters and cooperation in the field of military forces and armaments. 
Yes, and the agenda policy towards Russia. Special attention is given not only to these spheres, but to the European Union as a whole, with the main emphasis on the European Union and developing the European Union towards a federal union, strengthening the European Parliament and the focus on the sphere of justice, values, norms, uh, no specific uh, features here, but connected uh, with the policy of Hungary and Poland. Um, so uh, this uh, uh, focus on uh, values, uh, it is repeated again and again, and this is part of the policy of the Liberals and the Green Party. But uh, it is spelled out uh, that uh, there is a conflict, a system conflict with uh, autocratic countries. Germany will elaborate uh, next year uh, a new uh, national uh, security strategy and 3% of the GDP uh, will be allocated for defense and other international uh, issues, international, international policy, foreign policy. So this is the agreement concluded between the uh, parties of the coalition. And then, then we'll see um, uh, specific features of course, uh, there is much desire to respond to the discussions uh, within the European Union because Germany was not very active in discussing uh, these uh, proposals, proposals coming from uh, France, for example. And uh, so shortage of uh, interest uh, was quite understandable. And it's reflected in the agreement. Uh, the politicians understand uh, that Germany did not pay sufficient attention to these issues. So there will be uh, some activity, and uh, much here depends on uh, the elections in France. And if uh, Macron uh, wins this election, then uh, this triangle, uh, Germany, France, and Italy, is a good coalition which can contribute to the inner strengthening of the European Union. And the European Union then would be able to confront international challenges. So it will be interesting to watch uh, how our Ministry of Foreign Affairs is going to cooperate with the administration of the Chancellor. The first uh, contact between participants of the three uh, main partners is already obvious. The disagreement is obvious. So uh, the foreign policy is supposed to be in the hands of the Chancellor and uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And uh, the ministry is headed by a woman from the Greens party and uh, their policy is different uh, from uh, the policy towards uh, Russia and China is different from how the Chancellor sees it. And Olaf Scholz is a social democrat and uh, he is more devoted to the idea of uh, stability and uh, consistency of the policy. And uh, he believes more in cooperation, uh, finding Finding, uh, finding points of uh, common interest. So the first steps show that uh, the Chancellor and the Minister of Foreign Affairs um, will focus on uh, France, Brussels and Warsaw. I'm going to visit uh, these three places uh, to show that uh, um, these uh, centers are of interest. Uh, and of course, in Brussels, uh, they meet together, I think, today and tomorrow. 
to discuss uh, climate change issues. I think that uh, we can expect a more or less stable policy, but with the reference to Russia, uh, much depends on how things are going to develop. First of all, uh, there will be a trial of uh, Tiergarten murder. This, is, this will be the first test. We shall see the response of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and from the Chancellor and see how we are going to protest. And uh, there will be other situations which may affect uh, the policy of uh, Germany. And uh, yes, uh, we can expect uh, some stability, but at the other, on the other hand, uh, the coalition uh, is uh, going to exert pressure to make uh, the relations with Russia less stable, especially if uh, there are some new developments in Ukraine. Thank you. Yes, sir, for this uh, substantive uh, information, uh, fundamental information about uh, the uh, situation in Germany. There isn't much for discussion here. But colleagues uh, show to me that unfortunately we do not have much time for this session. We only have one hour. And uh, as we started a little bit late, I will take up a 15 time of the coffee break. So we shall extend uh, our session to make sure that uh, we have time for the speakers. Professor Marchetti, you're welcome. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Chair, and I'll try to, to, to stick to the 10 minutes you gave me. Uh, I'll present uh, a, a few bold positions for the sake of discussion and clarity, and of course, maybe we can later on discuss during the coffee uh, break. Now, uh, I see international politics played mostly by four great powers. And among them, there are two junior partners, and this is the EU and Russia. Uh, the EU strong economically, but uh, weak for security. Russia, the opposite, strong in security, but weak economically. Uh, junior partners, but with an important role. Uh, and I think a lot will depend on their positioning a lot will depend in terms of international stability and world order on where and how they position themselves in the global uh, system. I see three kinds of uh, um, sort of uh, hypothetical world scenarios um, for the future. And I don't give probability and likelihood to them, but simply three hypotheses that to some extent have already some elements uh, that we can see a bit uh, today. And of course, the first uh, scenario is West versus the rest. This is uh, pretty evident. We already see this uh, with uh, the EU, the transatlantic bloc versus uh, Russia, China, and others. Uh, there is a second scenario in which uh, sort of the Euro, Africa, Asia get together uh, and the U.S. remain uh, uh, alone. There are people who talk about U.S. solitude and going back to a kind of isolationist uh, idea. Of course, this is the Belt and Road Initiative uh, vision underpinning it, in which the EU gets in this kind of large rassemblement and uh, the U.S. gets out. And then, of course, there is a third possible scenario of a kind of a large West in which China remains uh, uh, a regional power in which Russia gets back in the West after being kicked out uh, during the Cold War and uh, in which the West managed to split the Sino uh, like they did in the 70s with this Sino-Soviet split. Now, are these not for tomorrow, obviously? I mean, these are just three hypotheses in the medium term, medium long term, but I think because here we are talking about four sides, because here we are talking also a bit with medium long term perspective, we shouldn't restrict ourselves to looking to what is happening today, which is, of course, important in policy terms. But that's not all. I think we should also have a, a more uh, a longer perspective. So, EU and Russia, I think, are important, if not even central, despite being 
kind of junior partners uh, with of course with a very different kind of relationship as as i'm going to say the relationship between the e the European Union and, and the US obviously is a formal alliance, uh, especially in NATO. Uh, the, the relationship between uh, uh, Russia and China is a different kind. I mean, the presentation today is made that clear. Uh, but still, uh, of course, uh, uh, Pierre uh, discussed the idea uh, that is very much uh, the center of the debate in uh, within the EU about the EU strategic autonomy, which in itself could create few openings to Russia. Uh, of course, however, we should not uh, make this uh, uh, too uh, naive. Uh, the EU is fully integrated to the Anglo-Saxon world, and I would say Anglo-Saxon now because it's US, UK, and the rest of the Commonwealth uh, post-Brexit, uh, in economic and political and security in, in ideological terms. So in that sense, uh, the European strategic autonomy could create openings, but within limits. Um, Germany and Italy uh, remain super transatlantic, I would say, despite the opening to Russia, despite, of course, having the SPD at the government, which in itself is an opportunity for reopening a bit the dialogue. Um, but social, socially and politically, and I would say also militarily, um, they are very much integrated to the U.S., and uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's a bit inconceivable to think about them sort of departing radically from that stance. And of course, France alone cannot make the strategic autonomy per se. I mean, it, France uh, is an important European player, but it's not enough. Um, so, in that sense, it's uh, it's despite the fact that there is a, a bit of a mismatch between official statements and policymaker orientations of the kind that, for instance, you can read in the last important documents that was the EU uh, uh, global strategy by uh, the previous uh, high, uh, representative Mogherini, in which, of course, Russia was perceived in a very negative way. Uh, but this does not entirely correspond to the public opinions. If you look at the polls and public opinion polls in the European Union, uh, you find a much more a uh, balanced uh, view among citizens. So, so there is this mismatch, there are some opportunities, but at the same time, we, we need to be very clear that the policy community and the policymaker community in the EU is uh, firmly integrated uh, with the American uh, community. Uh, on the other hand, of course, there is uh, the Russia that likes the EU, I think, suffer a bit of... Um, this kind of expectation capability gap that we discussed a lot in the EU, but I think also applies very well to Russia. Um, the issue for Russia, I think, is can Russia remain really alone in this system? Um, of course, Russia doesn't want to get integrated uh, in the West, or at least uh, this is the official position at the moment, but does not really want to become a kind of satellite of Beijing either. And But the issue is Again, can Russia become a loner? My, my understanding is, is that if Russia remains with this kind of um, uh, positioning, uh, is destined to have to see an increasing weakening, if not marginalization in international politics. Again, medium, medium term. So, <clears throat> I mean, if we take into account these kind of considerations, uh, I think there are many reasons to think that at some point, uh, a kind of rapprochement, if not reintegration between the EU and Russia should some, some, somehow take place. Uh, of course, there are many conditions for this to happen. Uh, the EU, well, the West in general, really should tame its push eastward, uh, uh, including the most radical options about the dreams about regime change here in Russia. I think all these options should really be uh, taken away. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, from the Russian side, there should be a kind of compromise in terms of uh, autonomy and exclusivity in its sphere of influence. At the end of the day, I think integration amounts precisely to that, to give up part of its uh, sentiment of exclusivity in, in an area that would be co-shared and co-managed and um, uh, 
co somehow uh, uh, directed by the two. So uh, I don't want to take uh, more time than that, but simply to 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 suggest that uh, uh, despite the fact that uh, um, of their relatively marginal position in international affairs, the EU and Russia shares a, a very important uh, role. Uh, for the future. And this role, of course, will depend a lot on uh, their own relationship between the EU and Russia and their own positioning vis-a-vis uh, -vis the two uh, superpowers, that is uh, US and China. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Out of the three scenarios that you have mentioned, uh, we can actually uh, make a th fourth one. So China and the US can uh, come to a certain agreement and the, they can join the EU in this respect. And then uh, there will be some kind of opposition between Russia and all the rest. So Artem Sokolov from Germany is joining us. The floor is yours. Uh, can you hear me? Dear colleagues, so can you hear me? Yeah, everything is fine. Dear colleagues, с приветом из Берлина. So I would like to be with you and um, I'm glad to be uh, uh, to take this opportunity at least online. So first, I would like to uh, speak about what Maxim Suchkov has said that uh, some years ago, um, a session after the lunch break could have lost the audience because uh, European issues are not that interesting to the public as, for example, US questions. So I would say that it's some kind of illusion because our American experts usually think that the US is the center of all public interest and uh, European issues are not that interesting to the public. And uh, I think that this is some kind of simplification because uh, Artyom, I'm telling you once again that uh, now I'm the acting director of the Institute. Don't forget that. Now, even uh, I can say that even before the pandemic, it was quite uh, uh, an achievement for a Russian citizen to go to the US. Uh, but if uh, a Russian citizen, for example, uh, wanted to go to Europe, it was much easier, of course. So Europe is closer to Russia, and that is that means that, that it's important. So if we speak about the latest developments, then uh, perhaps one of the major ones uh, in uh, Germany, it is the uh, elections, the parliamentary elections in Germany. And now we have seen a new chancellor elected in Germany, and we're looking forward to some change in uh, Germany's policy. So the elections were quite difficult. During the election period, the front runner of the elections uh, was different all the time. So first, there were some predictions then that the uh, leader of the Greens uh, would be uh, the favorite of the elections. The, then the two major parties were neck to neck. For some time, uh, the SDPG party chose Olaf Scholz as the chancellor, as the nominee for the chancellor of Germany. So he has quite a reputation as a person with practical experience. And that was the reason why actually he managed to become chancellor of the country. During the elections, external policy issues were not given enough attention that actually was 
uh, that concerned both uh, not only the relations with uh, European neighbors, but also it concerned the relations with Russia, for example. And I think to a certain degree it's good because uh, during the elections period uh, in the campaign, uh, just a couple of times, uh, the uh, North stream uh, was mentioned, but uh, not much attention was given to that, as I said. So Mr. Teschendorf uh, has said already that now uh, Germany is quite in a new situation uh, because now we, we, uh, Germany has a coalition of three parties and they are quite opposite to each other in terms of uh, political views. So the STPG party, for example, and the Greens perhaps are easier to come to consensus than the third party, but Speaking from Russia's perspective, perhaps a more favorable scenario would be for us if uh, the coalition were bigger with uh, the changed roles of the leading parties. So the fact that the Greens controls the foreign ministry is a factor that exacerbates the uncertainty not only in the relations of Germany and Russia, but also in general, in the foreign policy of the country at large. So Germany is famous for its quite consistent policy, foreign policy. If we remember the late 1960s, when the long leadership of the Social Democratic Party uh, we saw some changes there, big changes in the foreign policy course, but the changes were against some global transformations uh, in the international relations area uh, in the world. And it was some kind of precursor of the situation in the 1970s. So even major changes in Germany's foreign policy in this respect are not radical. Now we have a coalition of three parties, as I said, so they have come to consensus even sooner than it was expected. And the negotiations between them were quite on a professional level. But now we see some kind of discussion as to who is going to be the leader of the coalition in terms of foreign policy issues. So the uh, role is actually uh, traditionally attributed to the federal chancellor, but the other participants of the coalition, of course, will try to influence this policy. And I think personally that the processes of Euro integration will be slower in the coming years because the, it will take more time to, uh, to make some kind of discussion between the partners and to come to a certain conclusion. Uh, it concerns both uh, the uh, cooperation between Germany and France and uh, some other areas. Some time ago, there were discussions about the agreement between uh, Germany and Italy. Some experts said that it was some kind of cooperation, uh, uh, sorry, uh, it was an agreement between fr uh, France and Italy, and some experts said that it was some kind of counterbalance to uh, Germany. But I also think that uh, it is some kind of oversimplification because Germany's political and economic weight makes it exclusive in the European uh, area, uh, and makes it impossible for all other countries to come to agreement without uh, Germany's participation. So even it is impossible even uh, for France. But at the same time, if we speak about this uh, Franco-Italian initiative, then we can assume that in some time it will be added to the ASEAN agreement between France and Germany and make 
it will make uh, Germany, France and Italy the three centers of power in uh, European relations. And so perhaps it will be some kind of new driving force to Euro integration, which will allow the participants to find some counterbalance to other European countries that have their own views as to the future development of foreign policy of the Union. So I don't see any future breakthroughs in the coming time. But in a certain perspective, this work will be continued and it will be interesting to observe the new coalition, the new uh, government led by Olaf Scholz in the future. Thank you, Artyom. Now let's go from Germany to the capital of the EU and our comrade Simtak uh, is given the floor. Hi, thanks so much for having me, by the way. Um, so what I wanted to talk about um, is actually more of a, um, a kind of building block towards forecasting um, that future position of Europe at the international level. Um, so first off, let me start by um, uh, talking about what Mr. Teschendorf uh, actually spoke about, that narrative of strategic independence, which has been, uh, you know, one of the main, uh, I guess, new elements that describes uh, the intended course that Europe wants to take uh, in the future. Um, now, what does that actually mean when Europe talks about strategic independence? Um, uh, it, in one part, uh, it actually contradicts the existing transatlantic relationship. It, in, in some regard, it means that Europe is trying to define its own policy, its own position in the world, while being less dependent on uh, simply supporting that of the the, um, uh, the US and, and to a degree now the UK that sits outside of the EU. Um, but I think in addition to that, this is not just about the transatlantic dependencies. Uh, I think in addition to that, um, Europe is also looking to consolidate its own capabilities, which um, refers to those, um, those changes that would allow Europe to actually position itself as a unitary actor, um, to actually have a, a single foreign policy, to have that sovereignty delegated effectively from the member states to the European Union. Um, and then I think uh, perhaps to a, a slightly smaller degree, um, Europe is probably also looking at strategic in independence in terms of reducing its economic dependencies uh, on some other regions in the world. Particularly, I'm thinking of China there, where the the um, changes in, in uh, Europe's position towards China, um, as that relates to the transatlantic relationship as well, um, that changes uh, some of those economic lines as well. Um, now, you know, that's all great. Europe is looking for that strategic independence. Um, but the reality is that there's a lot of challenges for Europe uh, to actually do that. Um, the, the previous speakers have mentioned a lot of those. Um, so if we want to forecast Europe's actual position in the future, um, we need to actually get an understanding of, of how realistic those ambitions are. Um, and what Europe's actual limitations are. And uh, we've talked a lot about the internal politics of Europe in, in regards of the German and French and Italian um, dynamics that kind of formulate, um, as, as Artem said, and I wholly agree with him, um, the main centers of power within the European Union that would actually define um, how it evolves. Um, but in, in my line of forecasting, what I like to do is look a little more at, at systemic forces that are driving um, these different uh, dynamics. So um, in, in trying to look at how Europe moves ahead, there's a lot of competing interests and entities that actually make up Europe, not only at the state level. So we have those different member states that each have their own interests, um, but we also have uh, social forces, um, economic forces that are pulling and pushing Europe into different directions. Um, and I want to talk about two main categories of forces there, one being the, the centrifugal or outward forces, um, which refers to um, the those elements of internal competition, political divergence, um, 
those forces that may want to consider leaving the European Union as the United Kingdom did or that want to slow down its integration. Um, while on the other hand, we have a set of centripetal or inward forces, um, which are actually those that contain the unifying interests of the European Union, the, uh, the common economic ambitions um, or the, the political bureaucratic ambitions to actually um, establish the European Union as a super state. Um, so effectively, when we're looking at how those forces impact Europe, it's the combination um, or the competition between those different directions of forces or uh, rather the relative strength between those two uh, different directions of forces that will actually define the potential of Europe to achieve that objective of strategic independence. Um, now, when we look at those uh, centripetal forces first, so the, the ones that actually unify Europe, um, so we have a lot of drivers relating to common economic interests. Um, these are the original foundation of the European Union. So these are very strongly embedded uh, within all of the member states and the organization as a whole. Um, and, and these keep driving towards a, a continued desire uh, to increase the, the rate of integration that Europe already has, um, especially considering um, the current environment, the global pandemic and the economic damage that, that has that done. Uh, the Relance plan, for example, which, which uh, um, is essentially a consolidation or a concentration of European resources um, to actually support a common economic revival out of the pandemic. Um, uh, that's a very great example of how those common interests uh, or those centripetal forces um, actually take shape. Uh, in addition to that, we've got a lot of um, forces relating to the energy security of Europe. Um, so that's where we start to touch some of the subjects like Nord Stream 2, um, which is not just the German-Russian um, arrangement. It is one that affects all of Europe and, and Europe itself is uh, torn. And in a way, it might actually sit on the verge of those inward forces and outward forces where um, some uh, elements of Europe uh, consider this as a, as a potential threat uh, within a relationship with Russia. Others see it as a, a positive economic or energy development. Um, now, in addition to, to those particular topics that make up those, those uh, unifying forces, we also need to think of the European bureaucracy as a, an actor that actually represents those. Um, so even... Uh, regardless of all the actual political developments, the individual issues, there is a political elite, uh, a European bureaucracy that has a very vested interest in further developing of the European Union. Um, sorry, I'm suddenly getting the, the Russian translation. we have all of those outward forces, um, divergences and in interpretations of what Europe actually is. Um, some of that relates to the very core debate on uh, political integration. Um, as the European Union moves further and further along that process of integration, um, the demand for that integration actually decreases. There are, there are less and less um, people within Europe that actually support a further integration. So the resistance to it actually starts to rise. Um, and I think there, we are seeing that at two levels in, in Europe at the time. And on the one hand, we see that between states, and that is where, for example, the conflicts between the European Union and Poland and Hungary on their domestic politics and, and, their, um, and, and their considerations of, of human rights or rule of law, that's where that comes into play. And it, it forms a real important stressor on, on the unity of the European Union. Um, but apart from the level of states, I think we're also seeing that uh, on a, uh, a level of the populations of Europe, where we see increasing polarization, political polarization within Europe's populations. Um, it plays out differently in, in different member states, um, but the, the topics that are common to the European Union, such as the migration crisis, the, the economic problems, um, those are all shared elements of that political polarization. And that makes it difficult for European states to, um, to convincingly choose for one particular path. Um, now, 
without going into too much further detail to save some time on on those particular um uh, particular elements that make up those driving forces. Um, I want to finish by by kind of saying that the um, the evolution that we have seen in the European Union so far is that we've had a very long period of um, a, a dominant uh, unifying dynamic um, from the the initial establishment of the European Union through the, the adopting of the common currency all the way to the 2007 Lisbon Treaty, that's been a very strong push towards further and further integration. Um, and that dynamic continues to this day. But since then, there's been in more recent history, a parallel track of growing resistance uh, to that um, integration. And, and that I think is causing a, a potential stagnation in the future where um, the constant tension between those two driving forces or those two directions of forces um, could have a, a very paralyzing effect on the future course of the European Union and its ability to actually um, materialize its objectives in terms of um, actually becoming a singular political actor at the same level as the United States or Russia or China um, and obtaining that strategic independence. Tim, thank you so much. Uh, just for the sake of time, we have about less than 20 minutes left and we've agreed with, with, with Michael, we'll do a quick uh, Q&A just for us to have uh, more time for our own Q&A. So Michael, uh, and we'll do this in English again, just for the sake of time. Uh, three chunks of questions I think are important as far as the United States is concerned. Uh, one, where is Europe and U.S.-China standoff? Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, since the United States is really adopting the strategic competition framework, and whether you accept the formulation that Europe is a junior partner, it's not a part, junior partner, but it's a partner nonetheless. Uh, I think it's really put to a choice because Europe cannot be a bystander to this contest on the one hand. On the other hand, it also cannot have its cake and eat it too, as we like to say, right? Europeans would love to be able to engage with China, have access to that market, consume Chinese-made technologies, which are maybe better or cheaper, more competitive in some cases, but also be strategically aligned with the United States. And the United States, of course, is increasingly saying, you know, not up it up. So like you have to begin making a choice and your strategic alignment must have implications for your economic and political decisions in this realm. So I think that while Europe is figuring out what strategic autonomy may mean for itself, and that's a conversation it's largely having with itself, the conversation with us is definitely more in, on these grounds. Which way is Europe going to go? And the United States is slowly, politely, but increasingly applying pressure, I think, in, in a host of areas, and will be as the competition intensifies. It's only going to be more pressure. Um, you know, I think and it's important not to overlook the renewal of transatlantic relations, the much uh, nicer, more pleasant rhetoric and collaboration that's taking place now over the past year, in some ways making up for the very interesting years of the Trump administration, that nonetheless, beneath the surface, there's a structural and secular change in U.S. foreign policy and strategy. And I won't repeat my points from the earlier panel, that the primary focus of the strategy is on China. Asia Pacific is the primary theater. Europe is the secondary theater. And they have to adapt and evolve and think about themselves in those terms and what, what that also means for them. Uh, well, obviously, as a, as a Russian political analyst, I'm itching to say, hey, Europeans, this is the price tag for the relationship with the United States, right? But I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do it. Um, <laughs> not, not that kind of power, though. <laughs> like, right, right, right. That's, that's what it would be if you had, if you had that relationship with Europe. I mean, well, that's I'm why gonna, they don't I'm have that get relationship that. with you. <laughs> indeed, indeed. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But before that, and uh, based on what you said, what's up with European strategic sovereignty then? Yeah, well, it's like, uh, it's like the rhetorical joke from Gandhi at one point, you know, this is an apocryphal story. It's not true. But when they asked him, asked him, what does he think of Western civilization? He said, I think it would be a good idea. And this is your question, like, what do I think about European strategic autonomy? It's, maybe it's, it would be a good idea. But I've been hearing about this for a long time. So um, I think there are real challenges there. So the first is, 
Mm, realistically, I'll give you a good example. The Afghanistan withdrawal and European hand-wringing during that withdrawal, politically internally, over the fact that they are all taken together were militarily incapable of an independent policy or of even holding Kabul International Airport by themselves without us. And they knew that, and they were deeply frustrated by it. But that the reality is that even when the question would come down to a very small military deployment to pursue a somewhat different policy from us, that would be in any way... Oh, sorry. I can't imagine I spoke slower in Russia, yeah. but... <laughs> Um, but the reality is that, that, and they were pretty frustrating. You could see that frustration, but it was, it was very telling um, that, that, you know, strategic autonomy for Europe is still very much a conversation, maybe about the medium or long term. Let's look at NATO, defense spending in NATO. How are Europeans going to come up with additional defense spending or officer staff positions for a European force? Many of them struggle to meet obligations under NATO alone, right? When kind of the rubber meets the road, when we get to the to the critical question of, are they going to spend money for any of these things that would make them strategically autonomous? And many would also say that in the security realm, this in some ways would be competitive with NATO, these organizations as well, and, and they might not want them, but they certainly would, I think, I think would struggle to find the resources for them. You know, and of course, this is the big challenge of, you know, Europe defining itself in the sense, uh, it's the old kind of comment or joke from Kissinger, this is like the problem for the United States, if I want to talk to Europe, who do I call? So if Europe's going to be strategically autonomous or strategically sovereign, who will we be calling then in Europe if we want to talk to Europe? Um, but I, in some respects, honestly, I, I don't see it. At least I, I think that's a, that's a very long-term conversation. And by the way, with the NATO, there's still currently debate, should NATO's focus then be in theater in Europe mm -hmm. and, and essentially dealing with the issue of deterrence and defense? obviously focused and aimed at Russia, in order to free the United States to prioritize China and focus on the Asia Pacific theater? Or should NATO have a role in dealing with China? And also should NATO have presence and visibility in the Asia Pacific theater? There are different people on that side of the debate. It may be self-evident or clear to me, but that's also an ongoing conversation, right? So while we're talking about how Europe sees itself in a strategic competition, and the second question is, how does NATO see itself in the U.S.-China strategic competition that's being discussed? Uh, wow, tons of things to talk about, obviously. Uh, Europe and Russia, then, where is it all headed and, and why is it important? Yeah, well, like, I think Russia actually, in some ways, underestimates Europe or very much tries not to see it. And it's obvious why. Russia would prefer to deal with individual European states with individual interlocutors, rather than dealing with Europe or the European Union. And, you know, it's not clear if there is such a thing as European foreign policy or European national security policy. But the European Union as an entity is a pretty significant competitor, fundamentally, for Russia in Europe. It is a much more competitive, much more attractive model of economic local development because it is magnetic and attractive whether it likes it or not, whether you believe Europe is a strategic actor or you don't, doesn't matter. It is fundamentally a competitor for the former Soviet space. It is attractive. And individual members of the European Union are active competitors. And they're involved in these various, you know, uh, political disputes or rivalries for influence and so on. And this is important because the former Soviet space in terms of influence is still fragmenting. At least from my point of view, many of the conflicts we see are more wars of sort of second generation conflicts of Soviet succession. So uh, from that point of view, um, even if you don't think Europe is a strategic actor, it nonetheless is competitive because it is so attractive. And it does slowly displace Russian influence in these areas, whether Russia likes it or not. And that has a lot to do with, you know, where Russia stands in, in that relative competition as a system. What is the competition exactly about? Uh, the Europeans are not going to allow any post-Soviet states enter their market. They're not going to engage them in any of their political institutions. Is it like feeding promises of greater future or, or what's the deal there? 
Well, I wouldn't be so categorical about that future. I'm being intentionally provocative. I could see that. I could see that. I could see that. If uh, if you weren't worried about that, a lot of the things that happened in 2013, 2014 in Ukraine wouldn't have happened. So that's not that's not really true. Um, you know, first of all, there's a context of exclusive system because Europe fundamentally is a legal and bureaucratic and trade system. Mm -hmm. And countries that increasingly become of that are much more pli less pliant and adaptable to like the Russian way of doing things. Second, there could be mutually exclusive trade systems as well. That was part of the contest in 2013 and the conversation that was taking place in Ukraine. So, yeah, these are all important factors. And I think also from, you know, Russian point of view, of course, uh, European Union enlargement is a stalking horse for NATO enlargement because many countries join NATO so that they could get into the EU. <laughs> That's just kind of historically how it worked out for some of them. Yeah, at least they're interrelated. These processes are interrelated in some ways certainly from the Russian perspective. And I wouldn't rule out, you know, European expansion uh, in the future, but not necessarily as the European Union expanding, but as a competitive and exclusive trade and regulatory framework, yes. And as a competitive political economic system, for sure. And that has, that has, that has clear implications for influence and for who determines outcomes in this region. So... Uh the, the two questions that I have for you and, and, and the rest of the panel uh, that really are just short answers. Uh, one, is European Union a payer or a player? And the second one, uh, if you were to name one top challenge for Europe in 2020, what would that be? And that's the question for, all the, for the rest of the panel as well. Whoever wants to take it. First, Sim? Yeah, I'll have a go at that. Uh, the first question, I think the answer is it depends. Um, what level of analysis <laughs> are we looking at, right? Um, if we are talking, is, is, you know, is the European Union a player at the global systemic level? I would have to say not really. I, I would see it as a, a partner of other players that are much more prominent. Um, but of course, if we look at a more regional level, if we are talking about, um, you know, the Eastern European uh, competition with Russia's sphere of influence, for example, obviously it is an active player there. Um, now, the, what was the second question again? Uh, if you were to name one top challenge for Europe in 2022, what would that be? Um, I think 2022 is, is probably still going to be very much about crawling back from the from the effects of the pandemic. So I think we'll, we'll see a lot of um, economic challenges there. Um, but I think with that and kind of referring to, to some of the themes I was talking about, I think a lot of that is also going to bring with it um, the efforts to, to cure or, or limit the social divides within Europe, um, having that that polarization that is taking place within society um, not tear apart the political systems. And the French elections, for example, are going to be a very interesting um, thermometer of that. Thank you. Uh, Mike? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll be brief. So I think the player question to me is more interesting. To me, the conversation on European sovereignty is almost like a dated, boring question because I see international politics as defined by issue-based coalitions. So depending on the subject, there could be a coalition with you know, United States, UK, or France on one side, but Germany opposed and the like. And so that's really how politics are defined. That's why the conversation on polarity is, is kind of dated too. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it's more multipolar or bipolar world. What matters is the ability to influence outcomes in international affairs. And polarity doesn't actually dictate that. The United States is still by far the most powerful country in international politics. I want to disabuse you of any illusion that it's not. But the ability to dictate outcomes is a different question than the question of polarity, of who is the most, you know, power and potential. So to me, Europe is very much a player. European countries are. I don't know if Europe can be a player, because in order for Europe to be a player, all of Europe would have to consistently side on different issues as like one large coalition block. And I don't see that happening. But European countries themselves, I think, will always be players. And in that, in that, to that extent, yes, Europe will remain a player in international politics. Good. 
couple of quick questions, uh, comments. Um, challenge for 2022, I think, is definitely the strengthening of the tri -long, uh, triangle we discussed today, uh, France, Italy, Germany. Uh, perhaps closing the triangle, setting up, uh, opening up a dialogue for an Italian-German uh, uh, agreement. Uh, of course, we need to see the French elections, but I think this is the challenge, really. Uh, payer or player, um, and maybe reacting a kind of provocation to to Michael' uh, perspective. That was the the kind of uh, I mean standard narrative. There. Well, the EU without the US would not be able to do almost anything. Yes, but how would be the opposite situation? What would be the US without the EU, without the West? Maybe just a bit the Anglo-Saxon sphere. Um, so perhaps not sort of defending military and airport, but giving a very significant portion of legitimacy. And, and, and political strength at, at the world level. So in that sense, I, I, I tend to see the relationship uh, uh, slightly in a more encompassing way that, of course, if you focus on a strictly on the military dimension, it, it's, uh, I mean, uh, there is no much uh, to discuss. But uh, yeah, my question is always, uh, what would be the US without the EU? Would I be the superpower uh, without being the West, simply being? The, the, well, so to answer that first, EU is not the West. The West includes countries like Japan, Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, and they are incidentally the leading economies in the world, not Europe anymore. The locus of sort of GDP and international economics fundamentally shifted to Asia Pacific. A lot of times Europeans forget that the West is not just Germany, France, and, and, and the UK. But your question is very vital, and it's, and, and it's not necessarily provocative. You're absolutely right. Um, most of U.S. power and influence is channeled to American allies, and Europeans sit as the hub, uh, hubs of key trade, financial flows, and the like, international system. And, yeah, that's all important. You know, my short answer is let's try not to find out <laughs> what, we, what we look like without each other. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um... Yeah, to add on that, um, payer or player, um, it will be it will be both for for a long time. It is a player partly together, and there are there had been moments where they kind of synchronized, uh, like the sanctions regime against Russia, which holds till then, and which was, I don't, I know you don't like it, but <laughs> but it is really um, um, it was a success in terms of foreign policy making, as very different kind of position was combined. And is prolonged uh, for a certain time already. It's, it's a rare moment. Sometimes just a couple of countries uh, go ahead, synchronized within the European framework, and uh, act as a collective player. Sometimes only single countries uh, come out for certain issues. So it is a little bit more complex. And yeah, there's a couple of more uh, kind of uh, telephone numbers to call, but in a time where we, you know, get 10,000 messages mm -hmm. an hour it shouldn't be a problem to call a couple of more kind of numbers um and maybe it gives it a, a little bit more stability because this kind of collect uh, you as a collective actor won't change its policy you know with with an election of a president mm -hmm. um so it uh, it also has a kind of an element of stability uh, top challenge uh 2022 um is for me actually to um to remain or to to get back the intern, uh, internal coherence, like dealing with the issue of uh, Poland, dealing with the issue of uh, Hungary, getting a mechanism at start uh, to deal with these issues in, in future so that the EU can uh, remain kind of united um, as an actor, yeah. Artyom, if you could really quick, as we're 10 minutes away from, from the next panel and yeah. we need to give our participants a quick break. Yeah, I do it uh, real uh, quick. Uh, the first question, uh, I think the answer is both, that, uh, yeah, European Union, uh, Europeans are, is a player, but uh, in uh, many cases, the meaning of the play is to pay. And uh, talking about the second question, uh, well, I, I agree about uh, the pandemic is one of the key challenge. And I also think that uh, one another possible challenge is the possibility of new migration crisis, because we saw the 
uh, well, the, the, so the high importance of the events in the Polish uh, uh, Belarusian border uh, in this autumn. And uh, well, I think uh, if uh, we will see in this direction uh, uh, kind of new challenges in the cause of migration, it will be a real serious for uh, for European Union. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, uh, we took uh, some time from off your coffee break, but but hope uh, it was an interesting discussion. So I want to thank, and please join me in, in thanking all of all of our panelists for their inputs. Our colleagues uh, online, uh, Simtek and uh, Artyom Sakalov, thank you very much. And uh, please, please be back in the room in ten minutes. So the next session is dedicated to the questions of uh, the Caucasus and Central Asia, and I would ask you to be back as soon as possible. So, and you can uh, bring back uh, food and drinks uh, in the hall, please.
Меня слышно? Ну. Дорогие друзья, Difference. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, please take your seats. We are starting our third session today. Dear colleagues, let me introduce myself. My name is Sergei Markedonov. I am a leading uh, research fellow of the Institute of International Research of MGIMO and the chief editor of the International Anal uh, Analytics Journal. And our topic today is about Central Asia and the Southern Caucasus uh, as part of the post-Soviet space. And um, we have seven participants and one moderator. So in other words, time is quite pressing. I'm going to be quite strict in observing the timing. So I'm warning you. So the uh, time limit is no more than six minutes. If I show you that you have to wind up, please do wind up. So it is important uh, for us to have a Q&A session uh, for at least 10 minutes so that we can have some kind of discussion as a follow up to our presentations because it is important to share opinions, to ask and answer questions and so on. So I'm greeting our online participants. Today, uh, today's session has quite an interesting panel of experts. So first, uh, I, I will introduce them. Hassan Ozartem, Farhat Mamedov, uh, Okram Umarov, Alessia Vartanyan, Adil Koukenov, and so on. Uh, our topic is formulated in this way because uh, this metaphor of some kind of intermediary between uh, the post-Soviet space and uh, the greater uh, Near East so why uh, this region is so important? Or quite a lot of uh, problems in this region, including the Karabakh conflict, the Afghan factor and so on, so is deeply rooted in the independence movement uh, of the countries in the region. So at, at the same time, we can see uh, such processes in the region as, for example, geopolitization of conflicts. So first, originally, these conflicts were ethnic-based, and now we see some kind of exacerbation of the conflicts by certain geopolitical reasons and interests. So the Chinese factor has become in this spotlight, uh, has come in, in the spotlight in the region as well. We see new players that are uh, neither pro-Russian or pro-Western ones. So first of all, it is Turkey. So uh, now we see some change in the status quo. So we cannot say that Turkey has changed the status quo alone, but it has made quite a contribution to this change. Although Turkey has always been present in the region, but now it has assumed a new role. So the second one is the uh, phenomenon of intertwined conflicts. For example, the Afghan situation after the uh, um, leaving of the Americans there uh, is making new reality now for all the other countries in the region. So uh, we see different interests in the jihadist 
uh, forces, for example, in the region. Um, and now we have to predict their behavior in the future. So how it can change the situation with the uh, club of uh, pro-American sympathizers, so to speak. So the factor of is it some kind of scenario that is going to be close to that or in Syria? So all players that I've mentioned, uh, such as Turkey, Iran, are also very active in Syria. And so this is some kind of condominium mo model. Makes it very appealing to speak about the repetition of the situation uh, in the Ca Caucasian region. So, uh, Hassan, the floor is... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, I'd like to uh, say hello to everyone from Ankara. Uh, I have a challenging uh, obligation to you know, wrap up my presentation in six minutes. I'll try to do my best in this regards. Uh, I will be focusing on uh, what Turkey is trying to do in the Caucasus and particularly in Afghanistan. As you uh, know, uh, now we have a new uh, status quo uh, in the Caucasus after the November 2020 uh, agreement between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And it seems that uh, Turkey is really uh, closely following what's going on in the region. Uh, in this regard, I may say that Turkey has so many stakes, particularly invested uh, a lot uh, in Azerbaijan, Georgia, uh, Turkey relations in the last three decades, and wants to preserve these uh, relations in the upcoming period by uh, preserving the security and stability in the region. For, so in this regard, what's going on between Armenia and Azerbaijan is really interested uh, in Turkey. Uh, apart from this, I may say that Turkey was one of the member states, uh, you know, taking uh, responsibilities in Afghanistan. And after the withdrawal of U.S. forces and NATO particularly, uh, Turkey remained in Afghanistan and uh, tries to keep the uh, transportation and logistical channels open in the country. So in this regard, we may say that uh, post-Soviet geography or particularly Eurasia is one of the main areas of interest of uh, Turkish foreign policy. But uh, regarding Turkey's uh, interest, we may div divide uh, Turkey's interest, uh, particularly in the Caucasus and Central Asia, into two. In Central Asia, actually, what Turkey is trying to do can be defined as uh, power projection. But in the Caucasus, what Turkey is trying to do to become an actor in the region with, uh, you know, using some tools like uh, policies of integration, policies of uh, military force, uh, tools like military force, and also uh, wants to open new channels with uh, regional actors while uh, pursuing such a foreign policy. In this regard, uh, I may say that during the 1990s, Turkey had a more romantic uh, ideas about post-Soviet geography and tried to reach out to the in depths of Central Asia, but particularly in the 2000s and then in 2010s, its main focus uh, was the Caucasus. What Turkey has done since then, uh, you know, uh, in cooperation with Azerbaijan, uh, in, invested in projects like uh, natural gas uh, pipelines, oil pipelines, and uh, a railway between Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey. So these lines particularly led Turkey to reach out to the Caspian and beyond. So in that regard, when the war started between Azerbaijan and uh, uh, Armenia, the threats uh, posed on these uh, lines also, you know, uh, closely followed by Turkey. And uh, the Tovuz region, which was under the threat of Armenian uh, counteroffensive, I may say that is the main passageway of these lines. In that regard, uh, Turkey uh, staunchly supported Azerbaijan. And at the moment, we may say that after the agreement signed between Azerbaijan and Armenia, wants to develop these integration lines to and strengthen the transportation lines between uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey, and particularly in the eastern and western direction. Why Turkey is trying to do this, I may say that rather than having some political uh, you know, uh, objectives, Turkey perceives that there is an ongoing Chinese investment project going on in Central Asia. And this uh, One Belt, One Road project, which uh, intends to build up railroads 
uh, from Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey, you know, uh, will be opening an alternative route uh, to the region. And what Turkey wants to do also integrate the Caucasus in this uh, particular project by keeping the uh, logistical lines open, particularly between Baku and Istanbul. In that regard, you know, opening uh, a corridor between Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Nahçıvan is also one of the main uh, interests of Turkey. In that regard, Turkey supports an ongoing dialogue uh, between Armenia, Armenia and Azerbaijan. But we have some uh, risks over there. I may say that the two parties still, uh, you know, avoid to have direct uh, dialogues. And uh, it seems that uh, in the autumn period, there are still some slippery slope, particularly ongoing, you know, exchange of fires show that the uh, uh, the ceasefire is standing on a you know slippery slope in the region so what turkey wants to see uh, particularly a regional cooperation uh, in a three plus three uh, uh, mechanism regional actors like iran russia and turkey plus uh, azerbaijan georgia and armenia to sit down together and what they can do about the caucasus uh, to discuss uh, these issues on the uh, same table. In that regard, I may say that uh, what Turkey pursues as a policy uh, is somehow uh, compartmentalization of Turkish foreign policy in the region, rather than cooperating with the West. Here we see that Turkey uh, puts its stakes on cooperating with regional actors. And we saw this in the uh, November uh, 2020 uh, period, uh, in that regard, Turkey tried to keep its uh, dialogue channels open with Russia, and uh, this also served to the stability to be reached in the region. So in that regard, what Turkey wants to see is opening the region to the international uh, you know, markets, uh, and for this purpose perspective, wants to invest uh, in logistical pro pro projects like a railway passing towards uh, Armenia and reaching to Arme uh, Turkey. Regarding Afghanistan, I may say that one of the main uh, problems with Afghanistan, the international community doesn't have a roadmap uh, over there. What Turkey is trying to do... Sorry, excuse me, one, Turkey, one minute to yes, complete. One minute is enough. Regarding Afghanistan, Turkey wants to uh, keep uh, transportation channels open. For this purpose, uh, it uh, withdrew its troops from Afghanistan, but still has some technical person, personnel trying to operate the Kabul airport along with Qatar. For this purpose, uh, you know, uh, Turkey also in contact with Taliban uh, government over there, but up until now didn't recognize uh, the Taliban government. What Turkey is uh, aiming in Afghanistan to keep the state uh, functioning in the country uh, and also the uh, humanitarian assistance to reach to the Afghan society. But beyond this, I may say that unlike in Afghanistan, Turkey has some capacity problems to help a state building process in the country. And in that regard, the uh, you know, uh, pers prospective instability may undermine the stability in Central Asia. And Turkey's uh, perspectives regarding integrating these uh, regions to the eastern and western uh, you know, integration, integrated uh, logistical process uh, can be uh, put into threat. That's the main uh, problems for Turkey at the moment, and that's the uh, Turkish foreign policy towards the region uh, uh, for uh, 2021 beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, first of all, for your understanding and discipline. Uh, secondly, you have ensured a uh, great X-ray demonstrating uh, best uh, goals of Turkey in both regions. А в результате событий Второй Карабахской войны is it uh, or, uh, absolutely pro, pro turkish or is it balancing or is, does it continue the, uh, the the same direction uh, up and down thank you i would like to express gratitude to 
Andrei Andreevich, Maxim Alexandrovich, for the invitation. The title of my presentation is the Azerbaijan perspective for the year 2022 in the context of the results of the um, War of 2020. During the year 2021, we saw the formation of the status quo after war, formation of the status quo. It has not been completed yet, but it is obvious that the role of the, of the countries of the regions and the neighboring countries will increase. One of the risks that we'll have to face in the, the Southern Caucasus is the confrontation of the Dr. Russia and the West, because both centers have allies in the region. Geographically, it is a small region represented by three countries only, but each of the countries has its foreign policy priority. For Georgia, is the integration into the transatlantic uh, uh, community, and Azerbaijan is in favor of the uh, non-alignment policy. Azerbaijan will try to transform its traditional foreign policy uh, principle is not to become uh, the space of confrontation of geopolitical forces and uh, uh, neither at the national or regional level, the Southern Caucasus should not become the space of confrontation of the standoff. Azerbaijan has managed to implement this uh, thesis successfully for a long period of time, alongside uh, this principle of foreign policy made it possible for Azerbaijan to restore its territorial integrity. And uh, the war and the result of the war were not viewed by Russia as anti-Russian project, in the, and in the West as a project to oust the West from the region. As a result of the war, neither of the sides changed its foreign policy priorities. Neither of the economic projects, none of the economic projects ceased to function. Vice versa, conditions were created to implement new projects, new initiatives, which are in the orbit of interest of these nations, nations of the region, and the neighboring countries. One of the new forms of cooperation is uh, the format uh, suggested by Turkey 3 plus 3. In fact, it will be 5 plus 1. Tomorrow, there will be the first uh, tentative meeting at the level of deputy ministers of foreign affairs. Let's not be naive. We must understand that uh, differences between Russia and Georgia, between Armenia and Azerbaijan will remain. But uh, there is a need to create a format so that each country will uh, understand uh, some certainty about the processes in the region and the role it will play. For Russia, for example, it's important uh, that the territory of the countries of Southern Caucasus uh, should be used uh, by geopolitical uh, rivals. So for the Azerbaijan, the main purpose is to reduce the risks. Uh, for at present, uh, there are representatives of the military forces of three foreign states on the territory of Azerbaijan. So the remnants of the Armenian forces, the Russian peacekeeping contingent, and 60 officers of the Turkish military forces in the joint monitoring group. In these conditions for Baku, it's important to preserve its subject of international law uh, nature. Um, also, predictability is important, and also to provide the present uh, level of cooperation between Ankara and Moscow. And in the middle term, to um, have all foreign troops withdrawn from the territory of Azerbaijan. In 2021, uh, there was systematization of the format of each of the approaches to um, uh, regulate relations with Armenia and uh, the principles which will have to be implemented and which will uh, result in the slow risk. Otherwise, the escalation uh, and the risk of escalation is uh, quite tangible. So the risk is uh, that uh, the results of the war will be reconsidered, and here the arms race is an important element. It may result in the new escalations and new confrontations. Now, as to the national is, uh, approach, Azerbaijan in 2021 managed to diversify the formats and the agenda. With Armenia, we cooperate on the national level. This is the limitation of the borders, humanitarian issues. We do not talk about the status and 
in the eight, in none of the formats we discussed this subject. The attempts to change the agenda and return to the principles of, of the settlement, which are no longer relevant, as Sergei Lavrov mentioned, the status um, subject will hinder the uh, progress of the negotiations. And uh, uh, so there are threats in this respect, uh, but uh, uh, the threat is much less than before the war because the number of the Armenian troops uh, has reduced. In conclusion, I would like to note that in 2022, if uh, there is a more systematic approach to the agenda and the uh, decisions are taken on deblocking the territory, the process of reintegration may start of the Armenians of Karabakh into the Azerbaijanian entity. So the authorities are already created, the Karabakh economic region, and the economic mechanism is being created. And in this process, of course, there are risks because the revanchist forces will try to return to this problem. And the role of the Russian peacekeepers is very important here, as well as demilitarization of the zone of the temporary stay of the Russian contingent in this area. As to your question, whether we are part of the Middle East or post-Soviet space, I will answer in the following way. The potential for us to become part of the larger Middle East is in place, but uh, people are not willing to have it. Thank you. Thank you. After this conclusion, uh, yes, I have a desire to raise a toast, but uh, we have uh, work some to do, and thank you for your discipline too. And uh, like uh, the Romans uh, used to say, uh, let's give the floor to the other side, a representative of the Armenian expert community, the uh, um, Grant Mikhailian, our guest from Yerevan. Yes, you also have between five and six minutes. As we know, in the past days, uh, many processes have been underway. Uh, the status quo was uh, disrupted uh, and so on. As the main reason and the driving force of these processes, I would say the asymmetry. This is the Benel statement, as asymmetry uh, violates the balance and uh, when uh, the balance is violated, the status quo is uh, violated. But we must describe uh, the asymmetry to understand the situation better. So I will take a narrow approach and a more uh, broad approach. I will not talk about uh, Iran and the West because I have no time for that. So the first asymmetry is the asymmetry of resources between Armenia and Azerbaijan, that's clear. Now, Turkey and Russia, that's interesting. Here we have uh, uh, the following situation. In uh, eight, uh, 1982, uh, the Russian GDP was higher, the same as uh, the difference in population is growing. And uh, uh, Turkey is geographically more compact, less territory than Russia. And unlike Turkey, uh, uh, this influences the situation in the region. And it also influences the decisions which are taken by both sides and also desire to act and the arguments used in these campaigns. Therefore, when in Armenia, and some people in Russia say that the Azerbaijan aggression of 2020 was coordinated with Russia, I think that I, I don't accept this explanation. I think that a more, uh, a more, uh, a more uh, reliable explanation of the potential of Turkey and Russia. Second asymmetry is the targets. If Russia declares neutrality, Turkey declares a unilateral approach, a biased approach. We saw the strategic vacuum during those events when the US and Russia thought about their own problems and the Turkey as a growing desire decided to, to, make, uh, um, decided to make use of this situation and became very active, including Southern Caucasus. Are there any changes now? Both in Russia and in the European Union, there are attempts to change the situation. What happened in 2020, but as the status quo uh, was changed, 
and there is a new logic of development and a new uh, inertia. And I want to tell you that even at this conference, uh, uh, little attention is given to this problem, to the post-Soviet space. Asymmetry number three is entirely in the sphere of uh, soft uh, power. And uh, uh, the countries of the region uh, see themselves in a different way. Georgia thinks it's part of Europe. Armenia is between Russia and the European Union, somewhere in the place of Belarus, not where geographically it is really located. And on the whole, uh, it's not quite uh, uh, in keeping, but these options are European options. And Azerbaijan is more uh, pragmatic and realistic in its approach. Other aspects in the field of soft power is the asymmetry of the state elites and the stability, stability of the political strategy and the possibility to elaborate and implement their strategies. And here the situation is very different in both countries. In Azerbaijan, we can see there is some kind of cohesion, there is stability, and though there are problems of quality, but still uh, there is a certain evolution and uh, the quality of the elites, I think, is much higher than in Armenia. And uh, not only talking about uh, uh, the uh, recent Armenia, but even before that period. Now the contrast is uh, very obvious. There is another interesting notion here, another interesting asymmetry. And if a Russian and Western um, approach uh, is uh, to look at the region from the tactical point of view, deciding specific issues, specific problems which arise, the Turkish approach is different. They have a long-term strategy elaborated at uh, the beginning of 2020, and uh, it relies on uh, the doctrinal documents and helps Turkey to a certain extent uh, to maneuver and to manipulate uh, the uh, policies of major uh, powers, and uh, they use uh, this gap uh, uh, to their own advantage. There, uh, there is another aspect, and I will wind up with this aspect, and this is the asymmetry of sovereignty and the capacity of a nation to implement its policy. To, to what extent uh, this or that play is really a subject uh, of uh, uh, international relations. Uh, we are not always sure that uh, who we are going to deal with. For example, Lithuania undertakes actions uh, related against Taiwan or China. Um, can we be sure that these are really actions of Lithuania? And the same is true of the countries of Southern Caucasia, especially with reference to Armenia and Georgia, less for Azerbaijan. But uh, as to the foreign policy of Azerbaijan, is it really independent or is it under the influence of other states is a different issue, but less than Armenia and uh, Georgia. And uh, uh, as to the previous speaker and his statement, I agree that there is a risk of uh, uh, geopolitical confrontation. And if it happens, uh, then uh, the region will break apart. But uh, this is uh, not very feasible because uh, geopolitical participation in the actors is uh, rather uh, unrealistic. And in the recent years, uh, this interest has decreased. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for the honesty of your presentation. So you've been quite objective in your approach. So I can uh, remember here Eric Fromm uh, and his major work, which was titled uh, Escape of Freedom. Uh, now we can speak about Escape of Geography based on your presentation. Now I'm giving the floor to Olesia Vartanian, who is the senior uh, analyst uh, on the matters of the Southern Caucasus of the International Crisis Group. And I can remember here one of her reports uh, that was quite accurate in its uh, assessment. So all uh, the assessments that uh, the report contained were free of alarmist sentiment. And I hope that now we're listening to uh, a similar presentation. I'm not going to speak about the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, region uh, in detail, but I would first speak about our organization because um, what we make um, our uh, how we make our assessments uh, usually they are based on some field work, and uh, think. Uh, 
I'm very pleased to say that lots of uh, Russian experts um, are going to the Southern Caucasus um, more often, both to Armenia and Azerbaijan, and they try to make their own assessments of the situation without um, using uh, some other uh, uh, assessments. I would like to compliment what my colleagues have said, and I will speak about Georgia and three major points I'm going to make uh, that are extremely important in the context of the Karabakh war and the global um, consequences of it. So first, why nothing has changed uh, in the year after the Karabakh war, uh, and I think that nothing is going to change in the coming uh, period of time. So uh, I see a reason for that in the status quo, uh, be, uh, that uh, is uh, equally favorable to everybody. In the Georgian context, there are some observers that say that there is a risk of war, but reality speaks uh, the opposite. So we see that the uh, dividing lines are still in place, and in the last year, uh, we have seen that these dividing lines, uh, lines prevent participants from any armed conflicts along them. When the war began, I can still remember some anxious voices that predicted uh, the leaving of the West from the Southern Caucasus. Uh, we see that this trend can be present but at the same time, we see that such fears are becoming weaker and weaker with the new American administration and some stability uh, in the US-Georgia relations. So my major response to this question, why hasn't changed, uh, why so little has changed in the last year? So first of all, it's uh, thanks to the stability in the relations between the US and Georgia. So if we speak about the opportunities and risks in the context of this southern um, uh, Caucasus, so why this uh, three plus three arrangement not very good for Georgia? So for Georgia, it is some kind of substitute for its direct relations with uh, the West. And uh, I think that uh, the experts who are present here today know already that this is especially important for Georgia and very sensitive, especially in the context of the issue with uh, uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. So in other words, I don't have any doubts uh, about this situation with Georgia because there is not great demand in new changes within the three plus three arrangement. So the Karabakh conflict has entered a new stage of development and the frozen situation along the uh, front line uh, is persistent. And that means that there is still a risk of incidents uh, along the front line and it will make the whole processes of trade and uh, communication more complex than it is now. Without Russian participation in this process, this very complex regional cooperation is doomed. So, and in speaking of Georgia, so quite indicative for me personally was uh, a very cautious Russian position in this respect, because for over a year, we haven't seen any serious efforts on the part of Russia to invite Georgia as a participant in the process. So, which means that Russia actually does not want Georgia want, uh, to be very active in this three plus three arrangement. And the Geneva negotiations are in a stalemate as they used to be uh, before. So, Sergei has mentioned our alarmism 
Uh, Sergei Miroslavovich, the patronymic is different, yes. So uh, the deeper conflict between Russia and the West is still in place, uh, especially when it comes to the Ukrainian issue. And this is some kind of negative background that also complicates all other situations. And it excludes a situation where a new beginning can start in the political processes. Mm, so Turkey uh, is an ally uh, for Georgia. And we can hear some discussions that Uh, that it is an important factor in the political situation in Georgia. So we have to rule, to, to govern the situation on the field, so to speak, on the ground, uh, to prevent future crises and to exclude uh, possible sources of problems that we have to deal with now as a result of the conflicts that started in the 1990s and the 2008 war, uh, especially when it comes to humanitarian issues. And one more thing I would like to say is that without any ethnic nuance, uh, it is possible to speak about the situation in Nagorno Karabakh in a more technical way. Our crisis group, so, and here I've got some copies of our previous reports, and I can give them to you, that are very detailed about that. So we see it important to institutionalize the status quo. So the Russian peacemakers are limited in numbers in the territory, and they are not enough to protect the territory with the aim of stability uh, along the front line. So we see it necessary to introduce new mechanisms to uh, maintain the stability status on the ground and will make it possible for cooperation to begin. So we see examples of such mechanisms uh, in different regions with such frozen conflicts, for example, in uh, Abkhazia, south of Ossetia, or even in Donbass in Ukraine. In our crisis group thinks that a priority is the stabilization of the status quo that was formed in the wake after the in the wake of the war. Besides, we've got quite a huge challenge of displaced people from both Armenian and Azerbaijani sides, and we have to start a new round of negotiations on the Minsk. Uh, group, and I would also agree that it is important to cooperate between uh, on the part of the Western countries and uh, Russia um, in relation to Karabakh to prevent it from being a new source of instability and confrontation. Thank you very much. Now we are going over to our uh, Central Asian sub. Uh, category, subgroup. So, and I would like to uh, give the floor to Adil Kaukenov, a director of the Center for Chinese Research uh, in Kazakhstan. So, uh, Central Asia and the Caucasus are quite an important region, and it is important to understand that the agenda in Central Asia and in the Caucasus are completely different. And there are not so many mutual points of interest there. So, uh, if we speak about uh, the situation after the war in Nagorno-Karabakh, for Kazakhstan, nothing has changed in our relations with Armenia or Azerbaijan. So, we, the only question here that can be of interest to us is the rising influence of Turkey after the conflict. So, the closeness in cultural or language terms actually 
does not guarantee uh, anything specific. For example, we can see it in the relations of close, um, culturally close peoples in the world, if we speak about, for example, Russia and Ukraine. So, and this trend of friendship uh, makes uh, the situation more stable. Afghanistan is not of importance to uh, Kazakhstan uh, because we don't have a common border. And if there is some kind of armed conflict there, uh, Kazakhstan uh, will uh, stick to its um, ally obligations. But nobody actually uh, expects that from Kazakhstan because everything is quite in a controlled way. So here we see two directions of developments. So the first is some kind of global trend, and uh, that's exactly what we discussed in the morning session. So the this is the confrontation between the US and China. So uh, Kazakhstan has uh, an embassy in the US and the Chinese uh, embassy in Kazakhstan. They, uh, they are communicating in a very adversarial way. So China is criticizing the US and the US is criticizing China. But the American embassy in Kazakhstan and the Chinese embassies uh, in uh, Kazakhstan, they are trying to prolong their conflict on the territory of Kazakhstan unexpectedly. And one more thing here is that Kazakhstan is working hard on different European projects. Over the last five years, Kazakhstan has seen a rise in, 30, uh, in uh, international services by 35%. So primarily services in logistics, for example. And what we see now uh, in the relations between Lithuania and China, the major question here for Kazakhstan is uh, what to do with this uh, ongoing trend, because we have to create a new sphere here and maintain it in a new way. It's a matter of money, it's a matter of people working there. And speaking about the alliance between uh, Russia and China, again, so Kazakhstan is interested in the future developments of this alliance. So Mr. Putin has said that cooperation with China is possible. China has said that there is no limit in the potential when it comes to uh, Sino-Russian cooperation. One more moment, here is the, the relations between Russia and the West. So, for example, the West has imposed some sanctions against Russia, and the, this has some influence for Kazakhstan as well. Uh, if we speak about the regional track, which has three major factors, the first one is the following one. So, lately, uh, the president of Uzbekistan concluded an agreement with Kazakhstan to make their strategic partner partnership uh, to a new level of cooperation. For Kazakhstan, it's important because there is a huge potential in the development of the Central Asian region in the relations between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And this cooperation between the two countries have uh, some joint ventures and develop their economies. So one more point of importance to us in regional terms is the situation in Belarus, unexpectedly, because One Belt, One Way project that we are working hard on now uh, is going through Belarus. And so it is important for us to understand and predict the future developments in Belarus. And perhaps uh, last but not least, is the relations between Kazakhstan and Russia. Over the last couple of years, we have seen that these relations are in the process of 
transformation now. So in the Russian press, the Russian press usually uh, speaks about Kazakhstan either in a good way or uh, saying nothing negative. And Kazakhstan sees a problem here because in Kazakhstan we are very sensitive when the uh, uh, sensitive to our image in the world. For example, you can remember the situation and the scandal after the Borat film that was made by Americans, uh, and we reacted in a very negative way to the film. And at the same time, we are reacting in quite a sensitive way to what the Russian press says about Kazakhstan. So this is some kind of infantilism that we have to survive and to overcome in a certain way. But now we can see that the situation is changing in this respect. And uh, I hope that the answers will be given in our Q&A session. So, and now, well, thank you very much. So I would like to start our Q&A session with uh, discussing uh, Uzbekistan. And I would like to give the floor to Akram Umarov, who represents Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and I would like to thank Andrei and Demgimo team for organizing this conference because this conference is a, kind, is a point of stability and certainty in this world, full of uncertainty. And speaking, uh, uh, taking into account the uh, limited time, I would like to speak about the major trends of the outgoing year and of the coming trends in the future, in the coming year. Despite the fact that Afghanistan was perhaps the brightest development uh, in the outgoing year, I would like to say that we have seen three decades of modern Huge, uh, modern history of the states in the region. This is some kind of milestone in their history. And each of the countries in the region has acquired some national identity and is trying hard to attain regional uh, uh, sovereignty. And this awareness of regional sovereignty and identity makes it important to understand what is the source of future compromises and ways to cooperate and assist each other. And that is why we're trying to develop different regional processes at the same time, this 30-year anniversary provides, to a certain extent, uh, the proof that in the region, in not talking about the problems, we focused, we emphasized that we have survived the collapse, and now we are dealing with the resulting problems. But much time has already passed. It's too late uh, to refer to that collapse as the reason of the problems. And Afghanistan, which I mentioned previously, is the main event of the year 2021. The situation in Afghanistan creates new tension, new instability in our broader region. Despite the fact that we expected the Taliban as a consolidated movement, as an organization which will be able to impose its strict control of the area, we see that in the first months of their rule, things are not that easy for them, and the hard power uh, used by them is insufficient. They can still not control the uh, territory and uh, ensure stability. So uh, interaction is important in this region from this point of view. Uh, we need to understand how things are developing in that region. 
Some countries were criticized, including Uzbekistan, that uh, there is uh, too much interaction with the Talib, uh, Taliban. But I think the criticism is based on some pragmatic uh, uh, grounds. Uh, next, uh, events in Afghanistan uh, is, uh, is a land mile, uh, uh, is uh, an important uh, stage in the US politics. Uh, it showed that the US uh, is no longer interested in this region and uh, that there is a pivot uh, of interest uh, towards different regions for the United States. So with this in mind, uh, the way uh, the US left the region uh, without any substantive guarantees, without discussing this process with the countries of the region, all this uh, looked uh, uh, added, uh, added uncertainty to the region and also narrowed uh, the possibility of uh, traditional uh, geopolitical balancing, traditional for this region, and also reduced uh, the US presence in the region, which provoked in its turn uh, this uh, uh, less uh, geopolitical maneuvering. We also see here the growing presence of traditional regional players, uh, such as Russia and China. And, uh, uh, the factor of Turkish was an additional element uh, and uh, creating the union of Turkish states. The events in Afghanistan uh, are not yet uh, clearly understood uh, and uh, including here the role of Pakistan taking into account its influence on the Taliban movement. So probably in the future, Pakistan will play an important role, especially in the sphere of security for Central Asia. The last trend uh, is regional cooperation. Uh, it is uh, on the rise, but uh, not uh, as good as we would like uh, to see it. There are some achievements, but uh, there are no breakthroughs in uh, the larger uh, regional aspect. Uh, we see more bilateral cooperation uh, with, with Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, bilateral relations. And briefly the forecast, Afghanistan, I believe, uh, will become a, a serious problem. If uh, uh, Taliban manages uh, to uh, preserve its control at least till next summer, then we will probably see the beginning of uh, the uh, uh, maybe limited recognition of the Taliban regime by other countries uh, and uh, their resumption of uh, uh, international uh, contacts. The regional process of uh, deeper interaction uh, uh, is characterized by bilateral nature, but uh, taking into account the broader relations from uh, by Uzbekistan uh, in other geopolitical situations, uh, the uh, volume of interregional cooperation uh, may be on the decrease. The current processes of transformation will uh, be of great importance uh, for the future development of the region. Success of the reforming process may create a model for development of uh, the larger region of Eurasia. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, our last but not least participant, Kubat Rahimo from Kyrgyzstan. You are welcome. You also have uh, between five and six minutes. So first of all, I would like to, to greet anybody or everybody on the approaching new year and uh, uh, congratulate uh, Mr. Sushinsov on his appointment. Sergei Miroslavovich, thank you for reminding us that our presentations must be uh, mp3 and zip uh, i lost my sleep because of this so uh, several theses first thanks to the united states thanks to taliban great thanks to taliban uh, that uh, they blew away the center from the architecture in central asia and it be clear what is the basis of this architecture the mechanism of security which was founded uh, but the Russian Federation 30 years have passed, but still we see that everything was done in, at that time in the right way. So disintegrated in the right way. 
uh, no large conflicts at that time. Uh, and uh, despite all the uh, discussions of the fire of the Fergan Valley, it did not materialize, which is very important. Thanks to Taliban, it showed back in the 1990s that they do exist. And uh, now the population of Central Asia, 75 million, the army is the most modernized in Afghanistan. They bought very good equipment. They have very good military. Oh, no, sorry, we have very good personnel, although we don't have borders with them, but we are quite secure because we are prepared. The role of Russia and China has, in, has drastically uh, grown. We see it, we feel it. I think that the mechanisms work very effectively of the organization of uh, um, collective security. Uh, the Shanghai organization is also very efficient. They have regular sessions, exchange of opinion, 100% understanding and uh, uh, the, same, uh, the same goals, the same objectives. This is very important for the uh, servicemen. So we should not be afraid of a complicated uh, configuration. Some are members of the security organization, some are not. And uh, I have a brief suggestion uh, to consider the possibility of creating a border union as a, a kind of a, a whole Eurasian structure, which will bring together all countries of uh, the Central Asia, uh, the Russian Federation and Belarus. Armenia doesn't have a common border, that's the reason. And this border union will not introduce any additional commitments in the military sphere, like uh, the security organization, uh, but will provide the things to the technologies and big data uh, joint uh, database and uh, will uh, facilitate the transition on this uh, large, large, large territory and uh, also will uh, drastically improve security. So the idea of uh, one shop window, a window with uh, for the uh, border uh, for, for 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 the border authorities. Therefore, it is uh, funny to see uh, the, the border between uh, Kyrgyzstan and uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, well, for example, between Bulgaria and Greece, uh, there is only just one uh, point of uh, check. I think that we can do that. And this will remove also questions about illegal um, immigration and the similar questions, similar problems. Another proposal, which I have been uh, voicing since uh, summer, we need a joint um, Muslim foundation. 10% of the population of Russia are Muslims, every 10th uh, citizen, plus the whole of Central Asia majority uh, Muslim Muslim uh, population. So we need this foundation uh, to move to Afghanistan to help uh, common people. And uh, half of the population in Afghanistan are children. And the humanitarian catastrophe is on the rise. And UNESCO is asking for $2 billion to help children in Afghanistan. And uh, entering through uh, people of the same faith is not a bad idea if uh, we do not want to recognize uh, the present authorities in Kabul. So summing up uh, the case of Azerbaijan and Armenia, and that's why we are here in this uh, uh, panel uh, in the delimitation of the borders using the maps of the general headquarters and the archives of the Russian Federation. So this case is very close and uh, very important for delimitation of the borders between the Kyrgyz uh, Republic and uh, Tajikistan and Tajikistan to uh, prevent any possible conflict. So, uh, and some people may be trying uh, to use uh, these border conflicts in their interests, uh, similar to what happened between in, the, in spring between uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Therefore, let's look for common ground for positive uh, uh, phenomena. A very constructive note for your uh, for, yes, uh, for, your, for, for, your, for your statement. Uh, we started a little bit with delay. Uh, we have five minutes. Uh, we, we have time for a couple of questions. And uh, then uh, not everyone will respond to them, uh, but those who are willing, uh, those who did not participate in the discussion are uh, of maybe first priority.
Okay, yes, and Adil, you asked the question, therefore there may be an answer coming from you as well, and a general question from the moderator, from me. Again, up to you who would like to answer it. So, the United States men left Afghanistan, and the Minsk group, Russia dominates. What's happening around the um, Armenia and Azerbaijan, this is also a Russian initiative. So uh, uh, the West doesn't, doesn't uh, play any, no role, let's play any role. So is, uh, does the West have any role to play in this region? Yeah, I, I see that, Alessia. I wanted to, to ask a question first to uh, Akram and to Kurbat. To Akram, a question to Akram. So in our partnership with Uzbekistan, we have a big issue on the uh, energy uh, atomic power station. So there are, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is uh, the uh, economic community. Do you believe uh, that uh, Uzbekistan will join uh, the economic community? And uh, with uh, Kubat uh, about the border with Uzbekistan. So we can uh, talk about the border. But uh, with Kyrgyzstan, the question is as follows. Every time you have a revolution, you close, uh, we close the borders. But if uh, we have a common border, then how can we uh, convince uh, people in our capital that uh, this border will be controlled? And uh, answering the question why now and here, that's exactly my question to the Russian participants. So this is still an enigma, a mystery for me. And uh, as to the question about the role of the West in Central Asia, yes, uh, its role is less, uh, and the United States itself uh, says that you are not a priority, you're not of vital interest to us, we're not going to participate very actively. On the other hand, uh, I uh, asked once a question to our American colleagues, to our US colleagues, in answering my colleagues, they asked, what do you expect from us? And I said, in your geopolitical struggle with China and others, you kind of erase other countries from the map. And our request is, you are so great, so please be more precise, be more, be more careful, because we are also people who also want to live in this world. And they said, well, that's an interesting approach. We never thought of it this way. But please remember, we will not forget about you. So please, uh, I think the West will remain a participant of our events. I want to use the Uzbek poet. Uh, so we are also people, why should we subservient to, uh, to our bias? Yeah, that was a good uh, film. So I see two, two, two hands, Farhat and Hassan, Alessia. And we have uh, Kubat and Ahram also with a comment. Uh, so a minute for everyone, please. I cannot afford any more time. Farhat. Thank you. The West will not disappear and China will not disappear. They will all remain with their interest in the region. We must understand that the major trade partner of the whole region is the European Union. The United States can have a change of administration and priorities may change too. But Russia and Turkey, their role uh, of course, is much ahead, much ahead compared to other countries. I just want to remind you that the first exchange of the roadmaps of mine roadmaps was carried out with the participation of the United States. Therefore, if Russia wants to continue this trend, it should not lose the dynamics of the process of the negotiations. And uh, in uh, the Sochi Declaration, uh, it's not by accident there is a word, uh, this is strict implementation of the agreements reached. Because when there are gaps, there are lacunas, then somebody would like to fill them up. Well, a demonstration of physical laws, nothing happens in the vacuum. Thank you very much. I would like to ask uh, my colleagues, particularly coming from Armenia and Azerbaijan, is there a prospect for a peace treaty and the delimitation of borders between Azerbaijan and Armenia in the upcoming periods? 
And if so, what are the expectations from each party uh, to sit down around the table to discuss and start negotiation for such a uh, peace treaty between each other? Thank you very much. Great question, but please one minute for both uh, speakers, uh, please. As to the peace treaty, which is being discussed, we do not have any substantive proposals. What uh, uh, is suggested as a peace treaty is not really a peace treaty. That's the view from Armenia uh, for, for HAT as to the peace treaty. We sit connected with the limitation of borders as part of the limitation of borders so without commitments uh, to solve the problems in the political and diplomatic way, starting the limitation without a peace treaty uh, has uh, no, no, no future. Thank you. Thank you for your brief approach. My colleagues said everything. I will just go back to the slogan now, which you promoted before the war. And this is that the Minsk group is the only format where the United States, France, and Russia uh, cooperated very successfully. And probably this is the format which should continue and cooperation should continue, including Russia's participation, because usual practice shows that when you put all the eggs in one basket, then you drop it and the results are quite tearful, very sad, not just for Russia, but for the whole region. And in this context, of course, it could be of interest to see how uh, the uh, Organization of Security Cooperation, the Minsk Group, how it could be reformed. I'm uh, analyzing it, uh, how to intensify cooperation on specific issues rather than broader for uh, large scale issues. And in the past 25 years, we failed to find an answer to this, which resulted in uh, the um, last year of war. One does not exclude the another. One now we are in a peaceful situation, not a revolutionary situation. Then uh, there should be a possibility for, for people to move, uh, to freely move uh, across the territory. In the United in the European Union, we saw when uh, the crowd of people went uh, from south to the north, uh, countries introduced additional border checks. Nobody um, nobody abandoned borders. Uh, there should be facilitation of the process of crossing the border. Yes, in Kyrgyz, we like a coup d'etat, but uh, usually they are local in nature, uh, two kilometers around the parliament. Uh, and uh, if you go a little bit away, you see a very peaceful situation. So the specific nature of our country uh, is like this, uh, that uh, the um, general processes are uh, should be should be uh, denied. Don't be afraid uh, of the coups d'état in Kyrgyzia. Nothing, nothing uh, dangerous. So uh, they're not uh, they're not uh, uh, dangerous. Don't be afraid. Uh, I think that Uzbekistan is considering in a very serious manner the possibility of uh, uh, cooperating with the Eurasian Economic Union uh, that was declared on many occasions. Now we are already discussing uh, uh, shifting our technical standards uh, in keeping uh, with the uh, Eurasian economic standards. I think the final decision has not been taken yet, uh, but there is a serious approach. And I think what is important is for this process to be uh, natural, taking into account uh, the economic interests without pressure. Without, uh, without increasing political uh, uh, dimension. So it should not be a civilizational choice, either you are with us or against us. So in this context, what is important for the region is uh, the attitude to the region, uh, that uh, it, should be, uh, it should be an independent uh, a subject of international order uh, without, uh, without uh, the pressure of other international 
uh, actors. So there should be respect towards our region. And uh, if there is respect, then there will be positive response on the part of the region. So I will sum up as the moderator. First of all, our discussion was very constructive. I'm very glad that uh, we have had such a good discussion uh, and we have had a discussion not among uh, representatives of different countries, but uh, uh, among experts in the first line. So, and everything uh, has been very analytical, very logical, very consistent, and uh, it has given some ground for discussion, which is important because dialogue is of utmost importance in this respect. And uh, this dialogue has been highly uh, respectful uh the, there was no um unnecessary emotion in that and that was really good so uh the second point i would like to mention is uh what actually adil has mentioned um so these regions seem to be quite different on the one hand so china is not that present in the uh, caucasian agenda the afghan issue uh, can be felt uh, in uh, the Caucasus, but still uh, not that strong there. So, but still uh, we can see some mutual points. <laughs> which, uh, uh, as our unfortunately late singer has said uh, recently that we all have a mutual background in the Soviet uh, uh, history and we can see still the continuation of these processes that started long time ago so we can see very uh, acute geopolitical challenges uh, very traumatic moments that are rooted in this Soviet mutual background and nevertheless as I said the uh, uh, regions of Central Asia and the Caucasus are on the one hand very different, but on the other hand, are very common in their approaches due to historical reasons. And we cannot predict um, how these uh, common points will evolve in the future. So it can lead to some economic, cultural, political cooperation. So the transit approach is prevalent in the uh, in the region and as the editor-in-chief uh, of a scientific journal i expect you to make your contributions to our journal uh, and either as authors or reviewers so thank you again for this wonderful discussion and see you later
session of today's conference that is dedicated to the phenomenon of economic sanctions, which is one of the key instruments of foreign policy. Colleagues, we are starting, so please take your seats and be quiet. So the sanction landscape is changing and getting more complex. So we see different uh, focuses in different industries. So we see a stronger rhetoric about cyber sanctions, for example, and uh, some of the sanctions are becoming greener. So we see a new legal base for sanctions coming to our, our environment. But whether it's really an efficient instrument uh, is quite debatable. And uh, so I think uh, they are not that efficient, but uh, perhaps you have a different opinion. And we are going to discuss the criteria of political, economic, and different kinds of uh, efficiency of sanctions, and what are the motives and aims of introducing sanctions, and how are official, formal, aims relate to the real ones. We have quite an interesting panel here, uh, I would say geographically balanced, and I'm happy to welcome all of you on the platform of this conference. I would like to introduce uh, our speakers. So first, it's Evgeny Pregerman, who is the director of the Council for uh, International Relations from Belarus. Alex Alexander Zhivotich, uh, who is a professor in the Philosophy School of, the Bel of Belgrade University. Samuel uh, uh, Cherub, uh, who's been here for the whole day. Um, besides, we have Adlan Margoev, who is a fellow, research fellow of the Center of uh, Middle East Research of the Institute of International Research and Studies of MGIMO, and my colleague um, Mikhail Mamonov, uh, who is the director of the Center of uh, International Economy Studies uh, in, now he's in Zurich. So I would like to start with the first presentation and give the floor to Evgeny Pregerman. Please, the floor is yours. So as to the timing of our presentations, uh, it is maximum 10 minutes, but better eight. And I hope that you will stick to the timing. First, I would like to agree with what was said in the first session, that in the world of uncertainty, uh, we have to find some common ground. And I hope that, that our conference is going to be that common ground. Uh, that will help us to deal with this uncertainty. Uh, I'm far from being an expert in sanctions. I would like to share some ge uh, general observations of mine. Uh, perhaps experts will find them quite chaotic, he hectic, and superficial. But at the same time, I will try to speak about what uh, is uh, my professional interest in the context of sanctions, namely the potential of sanctional policy on the structure of international relations and the changes that we can see in this stru structure uh, and uh, how sanctions uh, interfere uh, in this structure and uh, become the driving force of change. So this question has been in the focus of my interest since uh, 2014. And now what we see around the situation in Belarus, uh, this question has become overly emotional, I would uh, say. And uh, I'm perhaps my presentation will not lack emotion as well, but I will try to be reasonable. So. So uh, I can remember the time when we uh, uh, expected a new um, block of sanctions against Belarus, and I was I, I can remember uh, myself sitting, uh, waiting for the presentation of uh, the High Commissioner of uh, the EU, Mr. Barrell, and it turned out to be that Belarus was the fifth 
points of the agenda in the uh, EU discussions. And uh, Mr. Burrell uh, started with the issue of Myanmar, as far as I remember, uh, and he started in the following way. So the situation in Myanmar has exacerbated uh, even more than uh, before, and so we have decided uh, to expand the block of sanctions against Myanmar. The same thing he said about Belarus and the situation there. So, uh, of course, it's clear that now I'm quoting uh, out of the context, uh, but at the same time, I can still remember my emotion because I was really impacted by this remark. So, if we, because uh, I just asked myself, how we can put it in the context of bipolarity, multipolarity, and so on. Or when Michael, for example, said that uh, polarity is not so important, but uh, uh, what is more important is the ability to influence. Of course, another question is what we mean by the term influence, but still, if we see the EU after a regular uh, session of uh, the uh, Council of Foreign Ministers, uh, that says uh, time after time that uh, if this situation is exacerbated, that means that we have to expand the block of sanctions. So speaking from the position of a normal logic, uh, this is not quite logical because if uh, the instrument has been uh, applied already, but it has not proven uh, to be efficient, then there is no sense in introducing this instrument even further. So, on the other hand, we can speak here about different discourses of uh, decision-making, uh, especially when it comes to the European Union. And it's clear that we see here some kind of uh, crossroads between foreign and domestic policy. And I will give my observation of that, on that. So, even yesterday I remembered uh, this idea, but I can say that about a month before the political crisis in Belarus, I participated in a close discussion with uh, uh, one European uh, delegation, or, or it was a delegation of the foreign ministry of one of the EU countries. And so the agenda had a point of whether sanctions were going to be and were necessary to be introduced by the EU. And what I said there in the discussion, I said that uh, I don't see sanctions as uh, a, an instrument of resolution, uh, but I see it as an instrument of aggravation of the situation because the EU actually aimed at releasing political uh, prisoners uh, from Belarus prisons. And one of the representatives uh, said that uh, I, uh, we, we actually understand what you, what you are saying, but we have to react in a certain way. Uh, and if we do not react in this way, our societies will see ours quite unfavorably. And th that is the situation that speaks volumes to observers, because if everybody understands that sanctions do not work, then it's not quite clear what to discuss professionally here. So I have had a look at uh, different publications, for example, uh, at the book uh, Economic Sanctions Reconsidered, published in 2007. Uh, this book concludes, uh, look before you leap. So, in other words, you have to think hard be be because, uh, before making a movement, making a move. So, if this crossroads between the internal and external policies of the EU, uh, works in this way, then there is no uh, point of discussing this logic, because the logic... So, 
this logic is some kind of chaotic movement, nothing else, in my opinion. So I will quote in English. And many of the cases we have judged to be failure would be considered successes if measured against criteria other than coercion of foreign policies. Это нас приводит к дискуссии, от которой тоже, я думаю, многие специалисты так точно устали, но не специалисты. So again, it uh, will lead us to a certain uh, idea that we should assess sanctions in the following way. So we see some kind of rationale behind the sanctions in the Belarus case. It is uh, the three requirements uh, for the Belarus government. So first, to stop repressions, uh, including ar uh, arresting people. The second one is to cancel uh, the uh, repressive decisions uh, of the past and to release prisoners. And uh, the third requirement is that is to um, start a, a political dialogue within the country. So then some time uh, passes and we see uh, that there is some kind of aggravated situations, uh, situation according to these three criteria. And we see that the Belarus uh, government does not have an opportunity to react and respond in some symmetrical way, which means that it has to uh, act asymmetrically, so to speak. And what do we hear afterwards in such academic discussions that actually pr uh, propounded the sanctions first? So they say what exactly what the book uh, says. And uh, in other words, they are trying to find some kind of efficiency in those sanctions. They do not see this efficiency, but they have to signal that they have done something, which means that they're efficient. And it's clear what exactly uh, they signal with their decisions and uh, on sanctions. They signal to their own public and citizens that they have done something, and they have shown uh, to third parties that uh, this behavior is subject to sanctions. So, but again, so we can ask a question, or can we discuss sanctions only in such technocratic way? Of course, it's not a good idea, I think. So what are the byproducts of such activities? If we have, and here I would agree here with lots of uh, official figures of Belarus and Russia, uh, according to whom, so the Western countries uh, behave uh, themselves in such a way that if they have to cooperate with such regimes as that in Belarus, for example, they will cooperate uh, despite the sanctions imposed. Uh, but it's not going to be um, a partnership between the countries. It will be some kind of strange cooperation between them. So the structure of international relations even without sanctions implied um, is changing. The balance of powers is changing. Uh, and there is more than one way to discuss what is going to happen in the coming day, in, in so in the future. So we are discussing how we can man minimize risks and uh, maximize our opportunities and abilities. But at the same time, if we speak about anti-sanctional coalition, uh, which I see as some kind of wishful thinking, uh, because uh, such countries cannot have uh, opportunities to create such a coalition. But even if we speak about uh, uh, decision shapers uh, in Western countries, in, in the activities towards Belarus, the, their attitude is changing in a certain way. So, and all these cases are geopolitized, so to speak. And uh, that uh, respectively impacts regional security at once. And uh, going back uh, to what I mentioned, discussion with the foreign ministry uh, heads, I asked them a question. Uh, do you uh, imagine uh, how this problem uh, will become a problem of regional security under the influence of sanctions? And uh, um, I understood it was not part uh, of their way of thinking. And uh, this is exactly what is happening. 
and uh, we spoke about this on many occasions today, which results in radical changes uh, in the, a specific region, uh, and uh, uh, it uh, becomes a chain of events uh, and that results uh, in uh, the severing of uh, cooperation. So going back uh, to what uh, Barrell suggested, uh, yes, uh, you just read a list of sanctions when he read the list of sanctions, but uh, we must understand structural consequences. So the question is, uh, who is going to win as a result? Uh, it looks like uh, no one does. And uh, uh, I'm just... Uh, uh, I'm not trying eh, to call for some regulations. I just want to emphasize the idea that we, like the countries which respond to all this, uh, can find ourselves in the situation, well, uh, we showed them back, but uh, of course we will, uh, but uh, who is going to win again? And uh, probably real specialists on sanctions uh, should offer here some uh, ideas, not uh, non-specialists non, non like me. Thank you. You raised an important issue, the quote uh, which you mentioned here today. So this quotation shows uh, that this balanced approach uh, towards uh, sanctions, which was characteristic for the beginning of the 21st century, it is replaced uh, by less responsible attitude to sanctions. Maybe this is due to the fact uh, that uh, the traditions of high power and uh, early Dresden uh, relied uh, on uh, the need to change the political behavior of the object of sanctions. Nowadays, though the motive is still officially declared, but in fact, the real objective uh, is changing gradually. And uh, this is an important tendency. Thank you once again for identifying uh, the importance of this new tendency. Now I would like to give the floor to Alexander Zhivotic. And uh, our discussion uh, would have been uh, uh, incomplete without uh, the analysis of the previous uh, sanctions cases and analyzing them helps us uh, to see the, con the long-term consequences of these sanctions and to understand the balance of uh, the effects and risks in uh, the framework of this retrospective analysis. So first of all, I would like to thank you all for the invitation to come and to speak about the efficiency of economic sanctions. I will speak as a historian, a person who comes from a small country, which three decades ago understood what international economic embargo means. And uh, I will try to answer your question, how effective uh, the sanctions were against uh, Yugoslavia, the Union Republic of Yugoslavia, and how they affected uh, the future economic and political development of Yugoslavia. As we know, in November of 1991, the European Economic Community introduced the first economic sanctions against Yugoslavia. And in this way prohibited uh, uh, exporting textile from Yugoslavia put an end to uh, uh, two point billion uh, euro, uh, euros uh, dollars uh, um, assistance to uh, Yugoslavia, which had been promised to Yugoslavia before that. Because uh, in uh, the zone of hostilities, uh, there were uh, violations of the ceasefire. At the end of May 1992, the security, the UN Security Council adopted the resolution which prohibited any international trade, scientific, technical cooperation, sports and cultural exchanges, flights and visits by civil servants of Yugoslavia to other countries. And then the United States and the President George Bush ordered to arrest all uh, members of Yugoslav uh, government uh, who were at that time, or oh, the assets, the assets of the government uh, to the tune of $2 billion. So then uh, the uh, Union Republic of Yugoslavia, Serbia and uh, Macedonia, uh, and uh, they, they found, uh, found themselves and Montenegro found themselves in uh, isolation. And uh, 
we could see at that time uh, the uh, differences of opinion uh, among the countries concerned because the president of France, Mitterrand, first uh, postponed uh, the adoption of the resolution when he suggested that sports events should not be included, but uh, he then decided to uh, leave it in the list because uh, um, uh, he received the written confirmation that uh, Serbian soldiers were to blame. And uh, then for several years, the French participation was to the effect that they were not, uh, they don't fully support uh, this policy. What else happened? And uh, what else is important to add here? The next resolution introduced uh, broad scale supplies to Yugoslavia and from Yugoslavia, export and import. Then uh, maritime blockade was uh, imposed and started with the operation which was called uh, Me Me Sea Guard. In fact, what really happened? The sanctions in 1996, the sanctions were lifted after the Dayton Peace Agreement. And despite the fact they were lifted, the United States preserved the so-called foreign, the, the external wall of the sanctions, which did not allow Yugoslavia to be a member of international organizations. The second series of international sanctions was introduced in 1998 due to the strengthening of the conflict in Kosovo. March 1998, Security, the Security Council adopted the resolution which introduced embargo to the arms supplies to uh, Yugoslavia. That was important uh, due to military and political reasons. And then uh, we saw the real intention uh, of these sanctions. Now we all know that uh, the Western forces uh, planned, the Western powers were uh, planned uh, and uh, armed uh, aggression. Uh, and uh, it was not connected with uh, the situation in Kosovo. It was due to uh, the uh, Western countries desire to prohibit uh, the Yugoslavian uh, government to buy weapons in Russia, modern weapons to uh, in Russia. That was the main reason. At that time, Russia was in such a state that uh, it uh, had uh, no possibility to pursue a different policy. But uh, that's an important period to analyze uh, because it was important for the Russian foreign policy at that time. In uh, Russia, there is a well spread, uh, the, the, uh, there is a well spread opinion that it was a turning point in the foreign policy of modern Russia. And it was the first point where the Russian foreign policy started to change in a different direction. Uh, these measures were followed by the prohibition uh, for the flights uh, from uh, Yugoslavia to um, European countries and also freezing assets of the Yugoslav government uh, and uh, then bombing of uh, um, Yugoslavia started and the new prohibition uh, measures were introduced, uh, like uh, prohibiting uh, oil import into Yugoslavia. In uh, October of uh, the year 2000, the sanctions uh, were lifted as a consequence of the so-called democratic changes. But uh, what is important is to answer key, the key question here. And uh, this is about the efficiency of uh, those sanctions. At the economic level, the sanctions resulted in the hyperinflation of the Yugoslav dinar 
hyperinflation from 1992 to 1994. So the uh, Yugoslav currency survived, survived the period of uh, um, hyperinflation, which lasted uh, for 25 months. The level of inflation amounted to 313 million percent. So this hyperinflation reached the peak uh, when uh, monthly inflation reached the level of the striking, the shocking figure of 5,578%. During the peak of this hyperinflation, the government of Yugoslavia uh, elaborated a new economic policy. And uh, several months uh, later, there was no inflation and uh, uh, there was uh, uh, the, the shortage of staple goods uh, was uh, uh, reduced due to the success of the new dinar uh, currency. The economic situation in the country uh, improved considerably. According to the Central Bank of Yugoslavia, this the policy was correct. And uh, um, this program uh, was successful despite the sanctions. So that showed uh, that uh, on the economic level, the damage seemed to be huge, but uh, the sanctions were not uh, fully efficient uh, because in Serbia, uh, agriculture, the agricultural sector was uh, well developed uh, and the energy sector was also well developed, uh, but there was a problem with oil because Serbia could uh, produce only about 30% uh, of oil necessary for its needs. As to the population, we can look at this problem through the analysis of the American Central Intelligence Agency, and this information now accessible. And in the analysis in assessing the sanctions introduced in 1993, they wrote uh, that the uh, Serbs uh, are accustomed now to periodic de uh, deficit, uh, long queues, uh, cold houses, and restrictions uh, of uh, energy use. And that was uh, uh, um, true. Serbs uh, were looking forward, they were waiting. Oh no, the uh, Americans expected that uh, the economic sanctions would be effective. Uh, and uh, they would result in uh, the indignation, in the unrest of the population. And uh, this will be a path towards political changes in the country. But uh, the sanctions had uh, quite uh, the opposite effect. Uh, Slobodan Milosevic, uh, Milosevic's regime was strengthened through the policy of economic sanctions. Uh, uh, domestic uh, changes uh, were carried out, and after the bombing of uh, Yugoslavia, during the air strikes, uh, uh, major major uh, facilities, uh, industrial facilities uh, were uh, destroyed. And this created conditions uh, to implement uh, the plans of the West. And uh, the policy of economic sanctions damaged greatly uh, the country, but uh, it did not result uh, in uh, the uh, in reaching the objectives. And uh, it became clear that when uh, the Western countries understood uh, that uh, the sanctions did not reach uh, the objective, uh, they pursued a different policy. So the next uh, step was connected with military intervention. And after the military inter intervention, uh, now changes started. 
Yes, uh, this is very graphic uh, illustration of serious economic consequences uh, following uh, absence of political changes, uh, which was the purpose of the sanction regime. Uh, now I would like to focus on another very relevant uh, sanctions subject uh, the situation around uh, the resumption of the Iran deal. Today, uh, there is a plan uh, for the joint session of Iran and the five international uh, plan, uh, participants uh, to resume uh, the comprehensive plan of action. I think there is a great interest in the resumption of this process, but uh, the view of the conditions, uh, how this deal can be resumed, uh, the views are different. Iran has uh, proposed its vision. The United States doesn't participate in the negotiations now, but uh, resumption of the deal is uh, one of the central objectives of uh, the current administration of the current president. So I would like to give the floor to Adra Adlan Margoy. Please uh, share your impressions with us. Thank you for, uh, for the opportunity to address you and the great uh, uh, yes, great participants. Yes, uh, people talk a lot about uh, the sanctions, whether they are effective or not, and I would like to focus on the final part. Usually, in the world politics, uh, uh, the final stage is uh, seldom discussed, and this is when the sanctions are lifted. And uh, when this happens, uh, there are there is a lot of criticism why it was done this way, not in another way, why the sanctions were not effective. And uh, as uh, it was mentioned previously, the seventh round of negotiations in Vienna is uh, about uh, how to lift sanctions introduced during the uh, Trump administration, what sanctions should be lifted, so which of them should remain. And uh, the great problem which I see, uh, Iran does not simply want the sanctions to be removed. It uh, um, wants to make sure that uh, there will be positive influence for the um, economy of Iran. I, I, uh, I deal uh, not so much in san with sanctions, but uh, with uh, uh, Iran's uh, nuclear program. But what is important is uh, to understand uh, the um, real nature of this problem. Uh, together with Daria Hirye, my, uh, my colleague, if you help me. So together with my colleague, I tried to get together all the ideas uh, which existed in the international uh, expert community, how sanctions are lifted, how it could be verified. I think we guessed the trend because uh, when we submitted our uh, publication, the first international publication appeared in a number of Iranian articles. And uh, we wished uh, we could have taken them into account in our article, but still the model which we proposed should be discussed because it proposes uh, an integrated nature to the discussion of the subject. The center is Iran and uh, the economy of Iran, and then the three baskets of measures which could be introduced to lift the sanctions in an effective way, to legalize uh, the channels of humanitarian trade with Iran. We saw that uh, Iran had very limited uh, possibility to buy medicine and medical equipment even at the time of the pandemic. Besides, Iran needed uh, support of its economy and unlike other countries which could receive a credit line from the IMF to fight the pandemic. Uh, this decision by the IMF was blocked by the Trump uh, administration and is still in place and uh, uh, Iran failed to get the support of the IMF. This uh, should be reconsidered as well. It did not happen, uh, though um, uh, it was expected from the Biden administration. And also uh, the assets of Iran in the banks of the third countries should have been unfrozen. That was uh, honestly earned uh, or, um, money of Iran. But as the uh, sanctions uh, were resumed, Iran uh, was, did not have access uh, to, these, uh, to this money. The third basket, the first was a financial humanitarian unfreezing. Now the second uh, was about easing uh, sanctions, uh, so um, partial waivers from um, primary and secondary sanctions. Uh, 
with a reference to the three main sanctions, uh, the uh, banking, uh, extraction, uh, and productive and, and production center, uh, sectors for transportation, insurance of cargo, all this which makes it possible for the Iranian economy to function and cooperate. To lift the sanctions against the banking system and to try to legalize, uh, uh, maintain the legalized channels of trade, uh, even through the central bank of uh, Iran, uh, so that banks could be verified in terms of clearance uh, from the U.S. perspective. And um, the fourth one is to give out licenses not for uh, individual delivery, which requires lots of bureaucracy with the Ministry of Finance of the United States, but uh, in terms of giving out licenses uh, for companies rather than transactions, so that the company is able to make multiple transactions uh, in its uh, um, relations with uh, counter agents in different countries. And in this respect, uh, the situation was uh, more or less the same even in 2015 after the nuclear deal. So still uh, Iran has to convince uh, the business community of the United States and the international trend now is that uh, there will be no volatility in the sanction policy on the part of the US and Iran is open for cooperation in this respect and one shouldn't be afraid of uh, making such uh, deals with Iran and so uh, Speaking about the leadership of Iran, so uh, perhaps a good idea could be to lift some personal sanctions against at least some of them. And we see that uh, there is some kind of will in the present US administration to go this way in the future. So, and if we uh, take all these measures together, then we will see how it will influence uh, the uh, economy. So there are internal and external factors in this respect that could influence uh, the situation uh, for the worse or for the better. So in terms of external factors, perhaps I will speak about two of them. So oil prices is the first one. In 2016, the uh, sanctions against the oil sector uh, were lifted. And uh, quite quickly, uh, the industry uh, was achieving more or less the same volume as before the sanctions. And the second one is the developments such as international developments such as the pandemic, for example, that are very difficult to prognose, to forecast, but still they influence, of course, the situation severely. So uh, as for the internal factors, so this is some comparison with the so-called black box here because we understand that the economic model uh, to a very great extent controlled by the state uh, is very rarely uh, efficient and uh, that is why we cannot predict uh, the situation in the economy uh, of the country besides there can be some kind of catastrophes um, in and blackouts uh, that are introduced some, sometimes uh, and generated by some uh, hacking attacks, but at the same time, they influence the situation as well. So, and uh, the subsidies and uh, the subsidies on the part of the government is another internal factor because almost all petrol uh, in the country is subsidized by the government. And one more factor is the unfavorable business environment. Uh, if you want to invest in Iran, this is quite an uphill task. So, as you see, uh, if we take into account all these factors, then it, it'll be really hard to assess uh, uh, or benchmark the situation, and uh, it is really hard to understand whether the measures were really efficient or not. 
So here we can speak about um, short-term effects when uh, uh, mid-term uh, factors such as, for example, the uh, currency uh, exchange rates and uh, direct and indirect investment and uh, as for long-term effects, uh, then we can speak here about the dynamics in GDP growth, uh, unemployment rates and household uh, efficiency. So, and when you see so many factors in one slide, you understand that on one hand, it is really easy to be a market, uh, an international nuclear expert coming for inspection in Iran, and you will put it in your report uh, that you make on the ground and then uh, send it to Vienna, but this is not enough to make efficient decisions um, when it comes to Iran, because it is really hard to take into account all these factors to make quite an efficient program of actions and uh, where you can assess where actually you were successful, where you did not succeed at all. Uh, and then you will adjust your policy according to these factors. But if you do not take into account uh, all of them, then agreements are really difficult to conclude. So there are no international standards uh, in lifting sanctions. And I hope that uh, the Iran case will make the expert community and the uh, specialists uh, in the area uh, to think hard how we can combine all these factors in one basket and to take the, uh, them into account when taking decisions, because this is uh, uh, very similar to an Excel table, for example, uh, where I can put all the data that is needed for making an efficient decision, and then I can have an instrument to assess the situation in an efficient way. And this technical analysis will make it possible for us to understand what is really happening on the ground. And so I hope uh, that further discussion will help us in this respect. So the thing that you have said, uh, uh, which is of great importance here, is the real statistics. So if uh, uh, thank you, Adlan, very much for your presentation. When we speak about uh, preferential statuses of banks and companies, uh, sounds like a utopia because there are no universal criteria for uh, such inspections. So what is a clear bank? What is a clear company? How we, can you verify this uh, clarity. Uh, so uh, can you control the compliance system of these banks? This is not quite efficient because even uh, such existing compliance systems uh, within banks are really hard to assess because there can be um, some data uh, that is important from uh, the point of view of primary sanctions but cannot be uh, efficient uh, for secondary sanctions and so on. So now I would like to give the uh, word to our American uh, colleague, Sa uh, Samuel Cherup. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm not a specialist in sanctions as well. I can't say that uh, I have uh, uh, I have quite an experience or background in sanctions, but I would like to start with the following thing. So. I would divide the question into two absolutely opposing categories. First, the sanctions that are adopted on the basis of the UN Security Council and the sanctions that are introduced on the level of individual national governments or trade unions. And the efficiency, the uh, of such uh, uh, sanctions are completely different. If we speak about assessing the efficiency of one category, we cannot oppose it to the second category and compare the efficiency. The second thing I would like to say is that I would agree 
and with the point that the growing list of purposes that sanctions have and here we can speak first of all about the sanctions imposed by the United States so it is based on the change in the policy of the object of the sanctions and the signaling within the process. Uh, usually we say that we are trying to signal something to our, our public, local public, I mean national public, that something has been done already and we cannot, we, we do not hope that sanctions Uh, well, that sanctions will cancel the uh, undue action of the object state of the sanctions, but we have to do something to respond to the violation of codes and rules. And by imposing sanctions, actually what we signal is that uh, to uh, the rogue country that we are ready for discussion and for dialogue. So in other words, we're signaling this way by imposing sanctions that everybody should be in line with the norms, international standards of behavior. Besides, there is one more motive here, and namely, uh, what we actually aim at is that it is quite uh, a privilege to go to the United States and to take advantage of its banking system. And if you do something that do not agree with uh, the US norms, then you will be deprived of this privilege. So what I mean is that any non-US citizen uh, does not have an opportunity to just go to the United States in, in at any time. No, this is a privilege that uh, should be uh, taken as a privilege, not as a given. There is one more motive that uh, now is uh, spoken about more and more and namely the motive of making an obstacle to the object country of the sanctions, creating, uh, preventing this country from doing something not uh, quite right. And first of all, it concerns Iran, of course, and North Korea, and especially their uh, nuclear programs. So the aim of sanctions here is to prevent them from obtaining nuclear weapons. And so some physical and legal entities are sanctioned against uh, so that they could not facilitate this process of obtaining nuclear weapons. So in other words, uh, what I'm saying is that there are lots of different aims here. It's not only aimed at changing the policy of the uh, object country. What else can I say? So of course, efficiency is quite uh, uh, an economic term. And uh, if we speak about only the economic aspect of sanctions, then of course, efficiency is going down. But not uh, to such a degree, to such an extent, that uh, we have, uh, th there is no trough here, because there is no alternative to the US dollar, not because it's so good in its way, but other currencies are less preferable in structural terms and it's not going to change. This is some kind of status quo. What I'm speaking here about is the fiscal base of assistance, of maintenance, and this fiscal base has proven itself to be weak 
after the crisis uh, uh, 2008 cri financial crisis and there are few people who believe that uh, any other currency can be comparable to the US dollar in terms of the financial system efficiency. Even despite uh, uh, lots of countries want to get rid of their uh, dollar dependency, they do not find any alternatives to the US dollar. And so, in other words, uh, in the coming future, we're not going to see any radical change in this respect. One more moment I would like to mention here is that we shouldn't think that the US government does not understand all the problems and all the downsides of uh, sanctions and sanction regimes. I have read here uh, in our, uh, before, bef before our conference, a new uh, overview uh, has been prepared by the US government. Uh, and the US government, of course, sees quite clearly all the disadvantages of sanction regimes. Uh, and they give quite interesting figures in this respect. For example, the number of So companies and entities that are on the list uh, of sanctions uh, of, uh, on the of the Ministry of Finance. So the Ministry of Finance of the United States says that um, over the last years they have included. Uh, they have expanded their list of sanctioned entities uh, by 933%, and they are not proud of that. And so we cannot say that sanctions should be a first line instrument. We understand that at the same time, although we can recognize the problems that have to do with uh, sanction regimes, but uh, those who impose sanctions, understanding though uh, these problems still will have the same instrument of imposing sanctions again. Uh, so in other words, what I'm trying to say is that there is no valid alternative to imposing sanctions in certain situations, although we understand their downside. One more thing. So according to the previous speakers, they have mentioned it already, so when we discuss the sanctions that aim at changing the policy of a certain state, they can only be efficient when they are part of a certain strategy rather than being a strategy itself. So there is, if there is no negotiation process, sanctions alone cannot be efficient and cannot re attain this goal of changing the policy. But if they are part of a certain strategy to work out a certain and get a certain leverage in negotiations to strengthen the position, the bargaining position, then. They are absolutely efficient, and we should understand that sanctions are adopted to lift them, although it may sound as a paradox. So we impose sanctions to lift them further. So after a certain change in the policy of the object country. So in other words, when we impose them, we foresee lifting them in the future. So, and without any negotiations in between, we cannot attain this goal, of course. So, if we speak about the policy, uh, the changing sanctions, uh, 
уверенность в правильности the confidence that in if the policy changes the sanctions will be lifted this is the key factor of the efficiency and as we have seen in the recent years for various reasons depending on the active work of the u.s congress uh, making uh, sanctions uh, uh, a law makes uh, this process less flexible and uh, there is uh, no process of lifting sanctions or uh, not, elab not elaborating uh, the rules of lifting sanctions uh, because of this uh, the credibility of sanctions is, uh, decre is decreasing uh, and this is the reason why the sanctions are not so effective. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel, for your structured arguments. And I think that if we agree with this thesis, then we can look with optimism at the prospect of the Iran deal resumption. And now I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Mikhail Mamonov. And uh, the people working at our center, uh, we have uh, been following very close, uh, closely the sanctions policy. And regularly we carry out research and use the various uh, econometric um, instruments uh, to see uh, the, in the influence of sanctions on the companies, on the banks. And I would like to invite uh, Michael to introduce uh, his final, his uh, very relevant up-to-date decisions. Uh, you have 10 minutes, please uh, stick to the time limit. Good evening. Thank you. I hope you hear, you can hear me well. I uh, thought well to use the presentation today, but probably uh, uh, have enough time for that, therefore I will limit myself to just uh, talking on the subject. Thank you for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to speak here. It's a great pleasure to speak addressing political scientists. Usually sanctions are discussed with the economists. I am an economist by training myself. And my task today is to tell you about the assessment of the economic effects of the sanctions for the Russian economy, which we received. You quite often uh, refer as political scientists to the low efficiency of sanctions. Let's look together at the uh, result of our research. So first of all, I would like to say that uh, I would like uh, the subject of the uh, sanctions to become irrelevant, uh, like in uh, the well-known uh, cartoon film, let's uh, live in friendship so that the sanctions uh, should become of second, secondary importance and that should not be used. But in the recent years, we do not see the reduction of this policy. On the contrary, it is expanding. And in the recent years, again, people started talk about the nuclear sanctions as the limitation of the, conver of the conversion of rubles into dollars and also swift restrictions. I don't know how you look at it. For me, this is a very radical scenario. From my point of view, not only uh, that uh, the Russian side uh, would not be prepared to resort to it, and uh, neither would be our Western partners. And here there are two factors. First of all, the Russian citizens living abroad uh, will mean that uh, you will not be able to use your um, bank cards anywhere. But uh, for Western countries, uh, they will not care about our interests, but there is another consideration, and here the Western countries uh, care, and uh, this is European business and American business, which have uh, its uh, branches in Russia. And as I specialize in the banking activity, I will just give you one example from the banking sphere. Raiffeisen Bank, which is uh, very well known, one of the major Austrian banks uh, has branches all over the world. And uh, the Russian branch of Raiffeisen Bank is among the top 10 uh, major banks in Russia. Despite uh, many branches in the world, uh, it's uh, the Russian uh, branch which provides 50% of the profit of the Raiffeisen Bank. 
And the uh, switching of uh, the Russian banks from the SWIFT system uh, will mean uh, that uh, if Raiffeisen Bank gets uh, its profit in rubles, it will have problems uh, about converting Russian rubles and the Russian profit into its, uh, or to its uh, mother bank. Maybe uh, asking for uh, railway cars or using planes to take all these Russian rubles to Austria. But who needs the Russian rubles in Austria? Therefore, in the present situation, it does not look very realistic, even from the point of view of our Western colleagues. Still, that was lyrics. And I would like to share with you my experience of the assessment of economic sanctions for Russia. Uh, our present colleagues, uh, the economists who uh, assessed uh, the importance of sanctions at the level of companies, Russian companies, uh, which have a trade with European and American companies. So the colleagues uh, uh, came to the conclusion uh, that uh, the uh, bilateral damage was quite considerate. But uh, American uh, colleagues, Angela and Demon, uh, who assess uh, the um, assessment of sanctions for Russia, decided that if we take into account that in 2014, together with the sanctions, uh, we also we, uh, witnessed uh, the uh, oil prices drop, then uh, the uh, influence of sanctions is about 1% of the GDP which cannot be considered as significant damage. So there is some kind of divergence. The microeconomists say that for the companies, the effect is the effect is high. The macroeconomists say, no, it is low. Together with my colleague Ander Pestova and our co-author from Zurich, we decided to analyze how sanctions influenced the Russian banks. And maybe here we can find an answer why at the micro, uh, macro level, the effect is quite low. What is important to take into account here, there are some details. So the uh, uh, US introduced two sanctions, two, two packets, packages of sanctions. One, less cruel on the sovereign debt, which prohibits 20 state banks and the control by the, by the state to uh, place the uh, sovereign debt in the international market so for a period longer than 30 years. The second package for the assets, uh, this is uh, more, more uh, harsh, and it was used against 24 Russian banks, which as a function in the Crimea have branches in, the, in Crimea, or they are owned by well-known uh, people like Kovalchuk's, uh, Rodenberg's, and they are more tougher because they prohibit uh, having uh, foreign assets and the credit uh, foreign, foreign banks or buy foreign bonds. So the very important uh, aspect here is the design of sanctions. Uh, though the range of Russian banks is rather limited, like I said, 20 state banks and 24 private banks or state controlled. So the sanctions were not introduced against all these 44 banks. It took about four or five years to introduce sanctions. Therefore, this delayed effect was rather curious. Uh, after the first announcement of uh, the sanctions in March of 2014 against the Russia Bank, we saw that all the other banks which were expecting similar sanctions in the near future, because they are either state-owned, they in advance start adapting the structure of their uh, so that uh, when the sanctions come, uh, they should have no effect. And this is what we show in our research. And uh, one of the unexpected results is as follows. In March 2014, the first package of sanctions arrived against the Russian bank and the Sberbank, VTB, and other major banks uh, against whom sanctions were introduced uh, six months later. They started not to reduce their uh, bonds. On the contrary, they started uh, increasing their debt the, in the uh, foreign uh, markets. They started doing this uh, 
and uh, that was 4.5% uh, of their assets and taking into account uh, the size of Sberbank, of Sberbank and uh, this is uh, one third of our economy. And uh, that was close to 3 trillion rubles uh, for six months. So that was a very considerable figure because uh, that was cheaper to buy, to, to get credits from abroad than in Russia. This is uh, how the world functions. So what happens? Instead of uh, the banks reducing their foreign operations, they, on the contrary, increased them uh, as far as the sovereign debt was concerned. As to the foreign assets, so the situation was different. Uh, the banks working in Crimea or owned uh, by well-known people, uh, when uh, they understood the possibility of uh, their assets frozen, they started to reduce uh, their foreign uh, assets uh, by about uh, um, uh, 0.3%, but uh, they are 30 times uh, uh, less, uh, smaller than Sberbank or other banks, therefore it did not have any significant effect on the economy, on the national economy. Another interesting dimension is uh, the fact that uh, faced with the need to reduce foreign assets, the banks started in advance adapting their operations. And when the sanctions started to arrive for individual banks further on, uh, they did not, the sanctions did not have uh, so much uh, uh, effect against Berbank or other banks uh, over the next five years. The economic effect uh, was uh, uh, decreasing, statistically unimportant. Uh, so it was important only in March of 2014. And uh, another interesting aspect, uh, we uh, discovered uh, that uh, the targeted banks, as a result uh, of uh, these developments, they did not start uh, to reduce uh, their domestic operations, uh, like uh, offering credits. They dis re redistributed uh, the activity. Uh, Berbank, Vitebe, and the other 40 banks, they reduced uh, credits uh, to the uh, companies by 4%. Uh, and uh, uh, increased uh, the credits to the population uh, by the same amount. And uh, as a result was credit reshuffling, which explained uh, practically zero uh, macroeconomic effect. And uh, to, uh, to, to confirm the result of our foreign researchers uh, about the effect for the companies and for the banks. Because as I said, uh, the crediting of the population increased. So uh, population won as a result of this activity. So the peak of uh, the credits for the population was at that time. And it was connected with uh, uh, consumer credits and consumption credits and uh, the mortgage credits. Uh, and the central bank even started to introduce uh, a, a limit of uh, the Russian uh, Russian banks in the fear of crediting the population and limiting this population. Therefore, summing up what I have just described, I would suggest that the design of the sanctions is very important. And it is uh, had, hardly uh, a good idea to extend uh, the spirit of introducing sanctions because of the possible victims of the sanctions uh, uh, can get get ready for the sanctions. Thank you. A very interesting analysis. Uh, we would like to get uh, um, better acquainted with the methodological part of your research. So if they are, if, um, will they be published somewhere? We would like to, to, to get access to your methodology. Thanks to all the participants of this panel, of this session. It seemed to me that it was very substantive discussion, well-structured. And uh, we had uh, a very friendly uh, tone, atmosphere of our discussion, which is optimistic. I think we can continue, continue our discussion on the current section, on the current panel during our working uh, supper, uh, working dinner. Now I'd like to give the floor to our spiritual leader, Andrei Sushantsov. Uh, one uh, uh, organizational announcement. Uh, so 
Uh, we are going to move to room 315 uh, for our dinner. I would like to thank our interpreters <laughs> who have been working with us uh, the whole day. Yes, uh, thanks uh, to our interpreters, and we did not make we did not make it li their life easier because we did not provide uh, any outlines uh, of our uh, statements. So the official part uh, of our um, meeting has come to an end. Now we move to the uh, dinner, room 315.